by ensuring educational excellence, we challenge and inspire all learners to positively impact their world. Topics, I would say, for the night, um, including our integrated math and also for security. Um, we also have some uh, recognitions that we're going to make. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, uh, and I will start with attendance. Present. Here. 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 Present. All right, we have a quorum. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, I wanted to start out by thanking our leadership team, our staff, and everyone for all of the hard work they've done over the past couple of months. Uh, the district is in the midst of a transition, and with that comes countless hours that are being put in to pull many things together. Uh, my peers sitting across from me have spent countless hours uh, trying to make some decisions and get some communication out to the district, and uh, we're uh, now at a point where we do have some um, concrete information that we are ready to communicate to uh, the community. Um, we have named an interim superintendent, uh, and he, in that, his name is John Silveri. Um, John has actually been a part of our district uh, in a number of capacities in helping out um, or in recent years. So uh, John's effective date uh, will be uh, following the June 30 timeline, and he will be assisting and working with the leadership team in continuing on uh, of moving our district forward. Um, the board has also worked tirelessly in identifying a search firm. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, being a public entity, we have to actually go through a process. of the search firm, and we will be moving forward to hope to have a recommendation to the Board of Education at the June 19th board meeting. In the interim, obviously, we are working hard to find a communication plan to our public. Uh, we believe that uh, transparency is, is important and critical to our, our staff, our families, our parents, our children, our staff. And what we're doing is we're going to develop a, on our website a page that will detail out many of what we'll be working on um, over the next couple of weeks and months towards the superintendent search. So we are in the design phase of that. Um, our goal is to have frequent communications on where we're at, including a timeline and what uh, families and parents can expect. Uh, so to be continued, but we will also have some communications and, and focus coming up. We will also have a, a letter that will be going out to families and also staff in the next couple of days. Uh, so we will be quite busy. Uh, we are listening. Um, if you have questions, issues, concerns, uh, all of these board members up here, all of my peers, um, has uh, worked really hard to stay engaged. And there's not one person up here that probably hasn't had a conversation or coffee with someone uh, regarding any issues. So um, be at rest, be at ease. We're working hard. And we will continue to work hard to communicate uh, so that everyone can understand what's do what we're doing and also stay engaged. All right, so uh, we're going to move right on to uh, approval of the minutes. Um, board, everyone had an opportunity to the review the minutes for our April. Oh, OK, we'll do. Got it. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to review the April 24th uh, regular board meeting and also the study session that was held on May 1st, 2018. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes as presented? So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the regular meeting held on April 24th and the study session on May 4th. Uh, all those in favor, stay so by saying aye. 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 Any nays? <coughs> Motion carries. All right, we'll move quickly right over to the superintendent's report. 
Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. And um, as you had mentioned, um, Jessica, we do have a number of people that we're going to recognize uh, this evening. So I'll go over there to do that. Uh, before I um, get into the specifics of the recognition, I do want to point out that Mohan Badwar, sixth grade student at Derby, read our mission statement tonight uh, and did a very nice job. And so thank you to him. Um, and I also want to point out that this past Sunday was a very important day in the district, um, important uh, celebrations of transitions for our students graduating for, from our high schools. So on <clears throat> Sunday, we had a graduation ceremony, 1 o'clock at Seaholm and then 4 o'clock at Groves. And then the couple days before that, we had a graduation ceremony at noon on Friday at the Lincoln Street Alternative Program. So it's all about um, taking stock with these fine young people that have uh, fulfilled our uh, graduation requirements. But it's also a chance to say goodbye to them as they now move on to uh, great things in their life. So for recognition tonight, uh, there's several, and it, this is a good thing, and it's something that I know that this board has felt strong about in terms of uh, identifying exemplars, and we know that there are many others that, uh, that uh, can be recognized in the future as time progressive, progresses. Could I ask, is Griffin Kuzlow in the audience? Griffin, come on up. Thank you for being here. Yeah, pleasure. Come on up. You can come on up. Too. And parents, feel free to come on up and take pictures. <laughs> yeah, let me share that with anybody coming up for this purpose. Hey, that's anybody awesome. coming up for this purpose, she's modeling for you um, <laughs> oh. what you should feel free to do. And so uh, standing next to me is just a wonderful young man by the name of Griffin Kuzlow. And um, along with some other students, uh, uh, we were able to recognize last month he, too, has accomplished an unbelievable thing that bears witness and bears uh, sharing with the, the board and with the community. Uh, Griffin is a junior at Grove, soon to be a senior, right? Yes. So next year you'll be, you'll be going through the graduation yeah. ceremony. Um, and Griffin is before us this evening because he, along with three other students in our district, and this is just remarkable, has a perfect ACT score. Wow. So congratulations. Just to point out, um, first of all, um, and others said this last month when we recognized a few of the other students, mine was far from perfect, so now that I have that on the record, but that's quite an accomplishment. And to share why that, how that's quite an accomplishment, it's really one-tenth of one percent in America are students that earn that type of score. And so I shared last month of about two million graduates in 2017, the last year that the data is available, there was about 2,700 students across this country that received that recognition. And what I pointed out last month, and I want to point out in your presence uh, so you understand, having four, you being one of them in this school district is just remarkable. So congratulations to you. We're very <laughs> So that's the other part of the recognition tonight. Once you come up, we're going to have you walk through and the board and the administration will shake your hand. It started in eighth grade, by the way. Well, you she teaches sure. everything you know. Yeah. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. Perfect answer. Congratulations. Congratulations. Just like through our graduation ceremonies, we really have terrific young people uh, to recognize. And with my uh, moving on. It's going to be one of the things I'll miss the most. So, Griffin, congratulations to you. That's the other thing to point out in the instruction manual for recognition. You don't have to stay after. You're welcome to stay, but feel free uh, to, to leave. I would now ask uh, representatives from Lincoln Street Alternative Program to come forward. Is uh, Mr. Bigger coming as well? Yes, he is. 
Yes, he is. <laughs> I'm glad you're directing him to do that. <laughs> Um, we have a, a, a great honor and privilege tonight to recognize some students, four students, one of which is here tonight, with our principal, Gary Bigger. Where'd you go, Gary? Right here. There you go. And uh, Mallory Soffin, uh, one of our teachers, who was uh, responsible for this activity I'm going to share with you now. Uh, the Michigan Alternative Education Organization has a program, a competition called STARS, Spring Career and College Competition. And we had four students participate, Cole Hendrickson, Peter Dickman, Dykman, I'm sorry, Rachel Muntean, who's here with us this evening, and uh, Christine uh, Kronk participated in, in this wonderful event. And so not only did they come together as a group of four to develop a sense of cohesion as a group, a nice outcome in and of itself for our students, but they were quite remarkable in what they were able to accomplish in this annual event that our teacher, Mallory, has been responsible for developing statewide. So this is a recognition of her and a recognition of some wonderful young people. Um, and so let me just share with you, um, uh, there were individual events, there were team events. Cole Hendrickson, first place human relations decision making, first place management decision making, first place parenting decision making. That's probably something that I could have benefited from as well. Uh, Peter Dykeman, that is a joke, by the way. I'm trying to yeah. <laughs> be a little light here tonight. Peter Dykeman, first place uh, career portfolio, first place management decision making, and first place parenting decision making. Rachel, who's uh, great to be here tonight, second place employment interview, first place management decision making first place parenting decision making, and Christina Kronk, first place employment interview, first place management decision making, and first place parenting decision making. Um, this competition gave these students the opportunity to practice real world experiences, and what they highlight in this organization, which I'm glad that they do, in a very non-threatening environment. And obviously, um, a competition is one thing, but you want to keep it in a way that really these students can shine, and they clearly have. And I want to be able to, uh, before we uh, give them a round of applause, I want to ask Mallory to be able to say a few more things about this competition. Um, so the competition is kind of like a career readiness competition, um, mixed in with a little bit of uh, artistic performance as well. Um, I've, I've run it for the past five years. I've taken students for the, for the past six years, and we've always taken obviously students who will shine and uh, represent Lincoln Street very well, but also students who I can trust and who are responsible. Um, I would say that a lot of the preparation came in the class that we, three, the three female teachers teach, which is senior seminar. It's for the entire afternoon period, and we do anything from career readiness and exploration um, to lying with statistics, to relationship Thursdays, and anything in between. So it really helps um, them not just shine when it comes to employability, but also in interpersonal skills as well. So um, with Rachel in particular, we've had her for three years. We've had the pleasure of having her for three years. And I will say, I'm not, not to embarrass Rachel, but she turned in from a cranky, you know what, uh, in 10th grade to the, um, one of the most beautiful young ladies I've had the pleasure of teaching, truly, and I, uh, I'm very proud of her. Oh, and, here's, and we in first place in uh, school banner as well. So, oh, and that great. was made by yeah. everybody at the that's school, great. so it was a team effort. So we have some certificates for these students. <laughs> and more important, we have an excellent example of a very fine student, principal, and teacher. So let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Sports team. Keep up the awesome work. Thank you so much for what you do. Thanks, Mallory, for the extra effort. Much appreciated. Hey, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. Big weekend. Once again, my friend, well done. Here. Great year. So it's a four year. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, okay.
Thank you very much. And now we have another example of, uh, that, needs, that bears recognition. And joining me are the Seaholm Maples eSports team under the direction of Lisa Passarelli, one of our very fine teachers at Seaholm High School. Lisa teaches uh, computer science and digital design and is also business uh, technology department. And this is a remarkable event. Uh, we had four students and an alternate participate in this event, and it led to a great outcome and through the competition and a great outcome for their lives. And so joining me, are, we have four um, students, sophomore Chas Strecker. He's the captain. He's captain. <laughs> boss. The boss? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. It's amazing that you seniors recognize this sophomore as your boss. <laughs> I, I, I think that's, that's a great thing in and of itself. <laughs> It's, well, that's great to hear. Uh, senior uh, Carlo Falletti. We have senior Michael McKay. Yeah. We have senior Justin White. Yeah. And senior uh, Jack Voigt. Couldn't, Couldn't be here. And the alternate was senior Derek Johnson. These are second place state <laughs> award winners through this competition. And through the competition, they did receive a plaque. And it's really a cool thing. They did receive each four-year fully paid scholarship, $64,000 to Lawrence Tech. Wow. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's wow. quite remarkable. Uh, this competition, let me tell you a little bit about it, and Lisa can really fill in the blanks much better. Oh, but no, it's Chad. Chad? Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, the captain? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, this involves the League of Legends. It's a multiplayer online video game developed and published by Riot Games for Microsoft Windows and Mac OS operating systems. Oh. And um, the game started in March with 10 weeks of matches, and there were 32 teams total from the state of Michigan. And this team qualified with 15 others for the championship weekend <laughs> sponsored by Lawrence Tech. And what's amazing that... Uh, for some of these students, their competition was broken up by their prom as well. So it's kind of like a pretty busy weekend, right? Oh, yeah. But you made it, right? Yeah. And you did really well. So the, the team qualified in the quarterfinals for the semifinals, then found themselves in the big auditorium at the school for the championship round. And while, um, you know, Troy, one of their high school, their groups in the end, uh, placed in first place, we should be very, very proud of what this group has done, uh, not only in this competition around the technology, but what they've been able to achieve as a result for their, for their future. So you want to share a little more, Captain? Well, yes, it would be really cool to um, actually, because of this growing industry in eSports, it's fun to see these opportunities given by things like Lawrence Tech and um, other universities like Robert Morris in Ohio, but yeah. it's, it's fun to see, um, be the first kind of wave of students to actually see uh, this growing industry, and I'm, I'm excited to see where this actually leads from here. Well, I think it's going to lead to some, some place for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, yeah. Yeah, well, great job, and congratulations. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the thing I want to say about this, these guys really came together. They just love the game. They just like to play. And when they found out they, 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 they had to play seven games, they had to be there at 7 a.m. after prom. And, then, <laughs> and they were. They beat me. Um, and they were there, and they played these games. And then as they saw they were winning, they said, we want to do this, and one of our members is taking advantage of the scholarship, and he wouldn't have been able to go to school, and now he can. And it's because these guys all banded together. That's the big thing. They're the legends. Oh, that's oh. Great. Is Preston Allman here yet? Well, good job. Good well job. Congratulations. 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 Congrat
You do? Okay. My boss can handball that. Who's the brains? Who's the brains? Who's the brains? <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. One more arrow in your quiver. Congratulations. Thank you a lot. Right? Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Congratulations. It's really great. What a great story. Congratulations. Love it. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. For all you do. Good to see you, too. Good to see you. Is that fine? Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're really uh, honored that you could come tonight. And Lisa, thank you so much for all you do. Uh, we're now going to take a, just a few minutes to recognize a paraprofessional and teacher of the year. Uh, there is a resolution later on in the agenda, but we feel you know, we can uh, spend some special time on the front of the meeting uh, in recognition of these fine individuals. Uh, joining me are Robin O'Keefe from the uh, president of the paraprofessional union and Preston Allman the 2018 Lisa Cole Paraprofessional of the Year. Congratulations to you. Thank you. And um, just to reflect on those resolutions that the board will act on later on, um, Preston has worked in the Derby Middle School ASD program for eight years. He is one of only two paraprofessionals in the Birmingham Public School District that's certified as a lifeguard which it's very important for these programs because those are life skills that we want to be able to provide students. Right. And it's obviously very important that we have uh, this type of certification. So we thank you for having it. And we thank you for the teaching that you do and support that you provide in those types of activities. Um, and then what has been said about Preston is that he's an individual that spends countless hours each year supporting students in after school activities, including, as I said, swimming, track and field and cross country. He's been commented to have an unbelievable work ethic, a, a reliable person, patient with kids, kind, helpful, uh, and an ultimate team player. And obviously I think those things symbolize what we hope in all of our staff members and it's really wonderful to have you as a wonderful example of those, those attributes. And so we congratulate you. On behalf of the Board of Education, uh, there is a check that is provided uh, to the paraprofessional of the year. And so um, we can't say enough good things about you, and we wish you uh, more, more years of service to our kids. Yeah, Hopefully so, so there'll be more. Want to say a few? Uh, sure. I'll keep it short because you guys have a lot to do. I just want to thank the board and Robin. I do truly love what I do in the, all year. You got anything to add? I, I could just add a couple. I keep it short and simple. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just would add a couple comments that the day that I had the opportunity to go to Derby to announce that Preston was chosen, the obvious love and respect that he has in his community at Derby Middle School was unbelievable. I think every available staff member that didn't have to be in direct attendance with, kid, with kids was waiting in the lobby and escorted me down. Oh, and that's what I understand, too. The <clears throat> lobby was I'm, full yeah, of people. It was, it was really quite people incredible. So, um, and that Preston got nominations, letters of support from um, his building principal, teachers, parents, and he's, in the four years that we've given this award, the first nominee who received a nomination on judicial letterhead from a circuit court judge. So that was, that oh, was wow. quite remarkable. <laughs> um, and just in closing, I think um, Principal Celeste Nowacki summed up Preston the best as truly an outstanding paraprofessional whose gentle spirit and dedication to the students he serves sets him apart from the crowd. So we're very proud to have him represent our association in the memory of our beloved former colleague, Lisa Coe. Congratulations. Thank you. And Preston is here today by his mom, who is also a beloved member of our community at Derby. Um, she is also a teacher there, and so it clearly runs in the family. <laughs> what Thank I've you. been told. <laughs> yeah. Scott, come forward. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I'm good too. It's all good. It's all good? 
Well, joining me now is Maureen Martin, the BEA Teacher of the Year. Congratulations Thank to you. you. Later on, you'll act on a beautiful resolution, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying the, the writer of that, and we appreciate um, your voice uh, because you obviously know these people, you know, the kind of detail, but we, we've gotten to know each other pretty well, too. <laughs> Actually, if I, can, if, if I can just <laughs> one joke on while Maureen's here. Oh, All right. It, All right. Uh -oh. Actually, our retirements, mine and hers, are actually a negotiated settlement between the. <laughs> we, we, we each gave a little bit on this one, so right. We're going hand in We're hand. We're going right? hand in hand. Yeah, <laughs> same graduating class. That's right. There you go. So some of the words that Scott shared, and I know later on you'll act on this resolution, but Maureen Martin has served with distinction for 42 years in this school district in nine different buildings, and that in and of itself is a real mark of distinction and of service and and you you know where everything is in this district and you know where all the stories are too right and, and closed a few buildings too yeah, right? that's right yeah when when she was recognized at their event it was uh, all these built names of buildings that are kind of distant memories now for for the <laughs> school district no no yeah, not I didn't you, do it. you had nothing to do with it at all uh, but she served as an elementary teacher a teacher consulting a learning resource teacher and an administrative human resources intern. So she's gotten to know a lot of different aspects of the school district, serving on a variety of committees. Most recently, the Special Education Advisory Committee, the Elementary Report Card Committee, and the Professional Development Calendar Committee. But probably most important, you know, she has a long list of accomplishments, but she is truly a master teacher and has dedicated herself to the improvement of the lives of the kids that she served. And she serves very special kids in very special ways. And one thing I will say, because that was revealed as well, that um, you know, when you have letters of recognition from the parents that you serve in the kind of program that uh, Maureen works in, that, that means an awful lot. Because it's, yes, this is recognition by her peers, but it's accomplished through the recognition by, by the parents that she serves. So they look to her with a, a great deal of affection and a great deal of, you know, Please help me with my children, our kids, and she certainly has done that. She's obviously been active in this district and active in the union, serving a variety of roles uh, uh, in the BEA. She's uh, uh, leaving as a, a teacher at Quarton, and what's been emphasized in the resolution is just how deep those relationships are within the Quarton community. So I cannot say enough to congratulate you and to thank you for your service. And on behalf of the, the board, this is for you as well. Thank you so and much. And we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you so you much. Want to... I, um, I accept this award on behalf of all my colleagues. Um, nobody teaches in a vacuum. We teach with our parents. We teach with our children, and we teach with the help of our administration and the entire district. So um, I'm taking this on behalf of all teachers. And I, now that I have it in hand, <laughs> I just want to say uh -oh. I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> when you love what you do, it isn't work. And this has been a really wonderful career. So thank you so very much. Um, Maureen received about uh, seven or eight letters from staff, um, a letter from an administrator, and then an equal number of letters from parents, which is unprecedented in the number of years that I've been running this as president. For, um, but moreover, she received a special letter from a student of hers, and I'm not going to say the name, but it compelled the committee so much by the end of that letter and what the student said. And I want to repeat the phrase and sort of summarize as why, what we do. And he said, I knew each day when I left class that Maureen Martin loved me. And the impact that she had on students in not just one year, but over a course of sometimes eight years or ten years in her role, changed their lives 
and they were told to us in these stories by parents and <coughs> students, and that's what, what makes a remarkable teacher in a community. And thank you for your support for our teachers and for this award. Mm. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Maureen, thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you what I, who I hope is a future staff member in this school district. <laughs> um, and I say it that way because later on you'll be asked to resolve his employment. And joining me is Omar Hakim, the recommended candidate for the assistant principal at um, Seaholm High School. It's Kyle, I thought Kyle was here. You want to come up too? <laughs> Part of your team, but I, I get the pleasure to uh, welcome him and introduce him. Um, let me share uh, with you, you know, I think the board knows, but for the members of the community that are here, we have a pretty extensive hiring process, and, and it involves multiple steps, and we do it that way because we want to learn as much as we can about these um, prospective employees. And I can share with you that Omar um, stood through that whole process in a very solid way, and uh, he's probably exhausted through that process. Um, I was only in one of those meetings, and I was exhausted. Um, but uh, we're really pleased to make this recommendation tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about his background. But before I do that, and I'm really not trying to check my, my email here, but he comes, it's a family package tonight. <laughs> so mom and dad, Galib and Nidal Hakim, please stand. <laughs> And he uh, brought along three sisters with him, too. <laughs> All right. I don't know if that's for protection or what it is. <laughs> Joanna, Arij, and Crystal, and two nieces. Aww. Told you we get the whole package here. <laughs> I think we need a team picture up front here. <laughs> whole family. So we have Lauren and Leah Yaldo here as well. Aww. So thank you so much. You know, really, we know that we don't stand alone with this work. I mean, we come to work every day and we do our work, but behind each of us represents something more than just us, and we know that in large part that's family, and we're so grateful that you're here in support of this fine young man. So thank you so much. Uh, let me give you a little bit about his professional um, um, background. Uh, I'll, let me start with the academic qualification. A Bachelor's of Arts in English and History from Oakland University. A Master of Arts in Teaching, Secondary Education from Oakland University. And then in May 2017, he received a doctorate from Michigan State in Educational Leadership, Curriculum and Instruction, and Teacher Education. So he obviously has the, those full credentials from an academic point of view, and his experiences uh, really round him out very nicely for this position. Um, he started um, as a teacher in the Troy School District, Athens High School, a teacher of English language arts. And then um, three years later after that, he was um, an alternative education program teacher in the Utica School District, uh, which obviously symbolizes that he's, you know, reached touching the lives of all kinds of kids in, in, in his work as a teacher. And then going back to Troy for a couple of years uh, in, through the International Academy, where he was a teacher of English language arts, and the middle school uh, programs coordinator. And then more recently, um, he worked at Oakland Schools as an online curriculum designer. And that was a, a part of his background that was viewed to be very favorable for this position in terms of having that strong curriculum background. And then right now, and I guess uh, we are taking him from uh, 
with this recommendation. He spent four years at the Detroit Country Day School as the International Baccalaureate Coordinator and the upper school English teacher. So we feel that he presents uh, himself with the kind of credentials that will allow him to do this work, both in academic preparation as well as professional experience. And let's give him a chance to get to share a little bit more about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me and my entire family here <laughs> <laughs> this evening. It's an honor, and we are humbled. Um, I would also like to thank the entire administrative team, um, the Seaholm staff, and the communi community members I met as I interviewed for the position for assistant principal at Seaholm High School. Every person I've met has represented this district so well um, with the kind of professionalism, kindness, and respect we hope to cultivate when working with our students. In the past couple of months, I've had the pleasure to learn more about Birmingham Public Schools and the kinds of opportunities afforded to all school stakeholders. It's been refreshing and inspiring to observe the district's commitment to uphold its mission and inspire learners so that they can positively impact their world. The mission is upheld not only by the Birmingham Schools a strong reputation, but by the initiatives the district seeks to innovate practices relating to teaching and learning equity and diversity, and character education. I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to being a Seaholm Maple, a title I hope to adopt with the kind of honor, integrity, and pride it deserves. Thank you so much. Omar, thank you very much. Yes. Really appreciate you being here. And now, uh, one more, uh, and an important one. If I could please ask all the representatives um, from our character education program to come and join me at the podium, I sure would appreciate it. Come on. Right. <laughs> I don't know you to, to be shy, so. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight, and um, thank you all for your patience. Um, and I just thought uh, I would be a superintendent of character tonight and recognize kids and staff. And, and then that just kind of supports what this program focuses all about. So I'm grateful for you to be here, and again, thanks for your patience. <laughs> On May 18, we learned a very special distinction for this school district, and it's one that symbolizes the commitment that we've held in this district prior to my time, throughout my time here, and it also represents an area that we need to continue to focus on um, because it, it, it's work not done. Um, and so we were recognized as 2018 National Schools of Character for the entire district, one of five in the country receiving that distinction for this year. And then five, five, uh, there were five districts, and then we had a number of schools that were also recognized. And so, um, let me just share well, what that information is about first and then I want to say just a few words about the importance of this work and recognize the, the great people that join me here. In addition to the district, um, Horton Elementary School also received the designation of National School of Character. In addition, in, additionally, many of our previously designated schools of character were redesignated as National Schools of Character, um, including Beverly, uh, Birmingham Covington School, Greenfield Elementary, and West Maple Elementary School. And what I've shared in my comments, well, first of all, before I share that comment, I've looked at this as kind of a, um, the second part of the duality of our work in, in the school district, and I've used the term <laughs> twin pillars since, since being here. We want our children to develop well as learners, but that's an incomplete mission for a public school district, and I believe for any type of a school, because working with the family 
we also want them to develop well as human beings. And so that's what this work has been about. And there's been just a lot of work right at the ground level in all of our schools to have this focus. And what I additionally shared is that as a district, we have held high the belief that our schools should be built upon a foundation of character. Uh, and I shared that I am extremely grateful for the work that has been done in this area, in our classrooms, working with families and community, because again, we don't have the sole responsibility here. And, and that responsibility is aimed at helping our young people develop the right kind of character qualities that allow them to move into their world as good human beings to take care of this world. Um, and coupled with what we hope for our kids as learners, we believe that's the total package. Um, in terms of the district uh, recognition, um, Jason Pesimosa, Mosca over here and Vicki Muir led that effort um, in, in applying for that distinction. Uh, we have representatives from schools here that have um, also now received that distinction. Uh, we have uh, Lori Seufer, former school board member, who is very much involved with this work at a national level and has helped us while the time she was here more as a trustee, but subsequent that to learn about this ongoing journey of what makes for the right type of effort in terms of uh, helping our kids develop the right kind of uh, character qualities. And so I could not be more uh, thankful. I think it represents a symbol both in the, from our schools as well as for the entire district that can uh, uh, separate us from other, other districts. Not that other districts don't have this commitment, but I think this recognition helps us understand that it, it's, it's been a solid commitment. It's been ongoing commitment. It's been at the grassroots level with a lot of autonomy, school by school. I mean, it's built on the 13 principles of character development, but there's a lot of difference in school by school as to how those 13 principles are lived. And so, you know, I also want to say I think um, any new superintendent coming in here would be really pleased to see this as a focus in the district because in the time we're here, yes, it's about high expectations for learning, but it's also, as I've shared, and I don't want to be redundant, but I will be, it's about helping young people find themselves as young people and to be good young people. So with that, congratulations. Does anybody want to weigh in? Who's going to do that? Jason? <laughs> Now that you got all dressed up tonight, yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're looking good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I, I want to start out first by thanking uh, Dan and Rachel for, for trusting me with this endeavor. Uh, I came to them a year and a half ago kind of saying, I think we're ready with the group. Um, and, and they allowed me that freedom, if you will. And that took some character on their part to <laughs> allow this young gun kid to go out there and do that. So I, uh, I really appreciate the two of you for, for trusting my leadership in this area. Um, I want to thank Vicki for co-writing with me. We spent countless hours together uh, pouring over work from schools across the district. We were extremely intentional in making sure that every single school in this district was represented throughout the application and throughout the evidences we presented in the application. So um, luckily we have a lot of connections across schools and we reached out to people we didn't know. Um, as many of you know, we have a very tight liaison group that works with Character Ed that's been ongoing for a very long time. And so we had lots of resources there to work from. Everybody in the whole process of gathering for the application was incredible as far as providing us with resources. I don't want to go any further without thanking those trailblazers that kind of started us out along the way. Um, Don Toby and Tamara Nast. I know Don was here earlier and Tamara who led this for so long in our district. Uh, I saw Don earlier today when we had our little thing beforehand, and I said, he said, Jason, you know, thank you for doing this. And I said, Don, you really just threw the alley oop. I just dunked it in at the end. You <laughs> blazed that trail for me. I just finished, finished the work that you did. And Lori, too, for being such a huge support for such a long time on the board and uh, being one of my mentors as we've gone through and done this process. So thank you very much. Um, I can't forget Shirley Bryant, who was here earlier, who started this oh, mm -hmm. 20 some yeah. years ago. So the very, at the very beginning of foundation. And just to close real quick, finally, thank you to all the people behind me who represent all the schools. They really put all the hard work and effort in every day. Thank you to the parents and kids that make us who we are in BPS. Thank you very much. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See it all the time. It, yes. Thank you, sweetheart. Say that out loud. Honey, thank you for your help. You. All over. The bakes were awesome. Thank you so much. How are you? How are you? Double dipping tonight, I know. Congratulations. My jacket. It's awesome. Thanks so much. Almost looking as Walter Rothschild down there in the daddy looking jacket. I don't know. <laughs> like leggings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Everyone on this side of the desk. It's kind of weird. Yeah. 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 What does it feel like being on the other side of this? Yeah. <laughs> you can just smile and nod. Oh. All right. Yes. Go. Thank you. Love it. It's so funny. Yeah. I know. Good stuff. If I could just say a couple things in closing. Um, Tomorrow there's an important uh, meeting uh, in the state of Michigan, and that's the conference committee to, uh, uh, relative to the budget meets tomorrow at 315. It looks to me, although I, you know, it's not over till it's over, that there's movement towards re resolving the budget, state budget, including for schools, and it's pretty consistent with what we've shared along the way regarding that budget. And then I'll just close by saying, yes, we are at the end of our school year. Um, we're coming into our last day of school on June 15th, where all students will attend in the morning and records preparation day in the afternoon. And as I shared at last board meeting, September 4th is the front page of the, oh. of the next school year. And so obviously Not one yet. ending, one beginning. Again, I'm being a wet blanket as we try to, <laughs> as we try to celebrate um, the end of this year. But thank you very much, and that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, we'll move on to board comments, requests. Um, I know we have a, a full agenda. Were there any items that we needed to add uh, to the uh, agenda? I just wanted to congratulate all of the graduates. This weekend was such a spectacular event. We had Sea Home first and then back to back with Groves and it was so wonderful to see a lot of the kids that I already knew. I mean, on a personal basis, I loved seeing my graduates walk across the stage. And I loved the effort that went behind this support from families, parents. There were grandparents there, great-grandparents there, and of course the parents. Um, teachers, the teacher speakers were wonderful. And it just made for a, a fantastic occasion. So I was very proud to be a part of that. Thank you, Laurie. Any other board comments, requests? All right, uh, we will move on to our public comment section. Um, and if you have any, please bring them up so we can make sure we get you uh, in, the, in order here. Uh, so because the Board of Education values public meetings, not just meetings in public, we welcome public comment on school issues. Most comments can be concisely stated in three minutes, and the board respects to respectfully ask that comments remain focused on the topic or issue and not on specific personnel. We welcome your comments, but cannot discuss nor debate items not on the agenda. When asked to discuss non-agenda items, we can share facts, but not engage in discussion. We need to follow laws regarding public notice on issues and be aware that other community members may have interest in the topic, but without proper notice may not be present to contribute. Uh, that being said, we will start with Jonathan Kroll. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you to everybody for allowing me to speak. You know, I was going to come up here and say all kinds of things. Um, basically, I just want to convey, uh, convey my sadness. Um, you know, it looks like a done deal, you know. Uh, students have spoken, you know, these survey results are terrible if you really look at them. Parents have spoken numerous times. It's, it's really, it's a sad thing because, you know, we don't learn, you know, integrated swimming. We don't learn integrated bike riding. We don't learn integrated foreign languages. You know, we don't learn the future tense of one language and then next day we learn, you know, past tense of another language. There's a reason these uh, uh, math classes have been taught in the order it's been taught for centuries, because you need to know the building blocks before you move on. And just to see all the harm that's been caused this past year, by, and so many parents I've talked to, and how everything has been ignored just makes me sad. And that's pretty much it. 
Thank you for your comments, Jonathan. Uh, we will move on to Melissa Borgeist. I have to apologize for my Kathleen Turner tone of voice. I try to speak <laughs> clearly. Obviously, it's important to me that I be here tonight, um, despite not having much of a voice. Um, as the parent of a non-advanced college prep ninth grader, I have so many, many thoughts and feelings about year one of CPM's integrated math program here in Birmingham schools. Unfortunately, none of them are good. Many of them have been shared by me and other community members. And sadly, I'm pretty much resigned to the belief that few of them will ultimately come to bear on the decision made tonight. I do honestly recognize and appreciate the many opportunities I've been given to voice them, and that's why I'm here using tonight's last opportunity to limit my focus to two particular concerns that I hope will resonate in the minds and the hearts of the board members as they cast votes on this contentious program's future. First, be wary of data. American humorist Mark Twain once said, figures often beguile me, particularly when I have the arranging of them myself, in which case the remark attributed to Disraeli would apply with justice and force. There are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Data is duplicitous. It is hailed as subjective, scientific, non-emotional, and non-anecdotal. Uh, but these figures, as Twain observed, can beguile in their arrangement, innocently or intentionally. Just today, I was privy to a transcript of a parent's attempt to learn more about the impact of the CPM integrated math program on students' SAT and ACT scores. Of course, that data isn't available yet in Birmingham as the program has only been implemented with advanced 8th graders and non-advanced college prep 9th graders. Yet I find something beguiling in what was offered to the parent. Grades and NWEA scores from the advanced 8th graders, no data pertaining to the non-advanced college prep 9th graders, and scores on the California Smarter Balanced Assessment, a state assessment, not a national college entrance exam. Apples, oranges, and shells. Secondly, Take to heart the anecdotal evidence. Somewhere I read that the plural of anecdote is not data, and that is true. However, students and their experiences cannot and should not be reduced to data points to be held up to the light and made public when they serve a purpose, and downplayed, diminished, or ignored when they work against that purpose. No matter what data can and has been called and offered to make a case for moving forward with CPM's integrated math program, Please remember the faces, the voices, and the stories brought to light at Board of Education meetings, community forums, and more. Parents, many of whom themselves are educators, attended meetings and spoke to their children's experiences repeatedly, and their stories should not be forgotten or overshadowed by data. I am sure many of them wish they could be here tonight, as they have been on so many other occasions, yet commitments, conflicts, and probably exhaustion, frustration, and resignation keep many away. I'm here tonight simply because I want to again make public the anecdotal evidence that my non-advanced college prep ninth grade student embodies, especially since I truly believe the data attached to him and others like him is not being properly brought to bear. I haven't seen the data he and his fellow non-advanced college prep ninth grade students posted on the PSAT 8-9 test. In fact, I had not been made aware of his PSAT scores at all. In fact, they've been available for weeks, and I found them myself through the College Board's PSAT 8-9 score reporting site. Unsurprisingly, he did not shine on the math portion of the exam. He's not one of the 92 advanced 8th graders in Integrated 1 at Derby Middle School who are earning an A or a B right now. He's a kid whose parents blindly trusted in his placement in a brand new math program that was poorly implemented in the two trimesters he attempted to persevere through. Sure, he passed both, the first with a B minus, the second with a D. When asked by the district via its survey, he reported his frustration a little more diplomatically than some of his classmates. At the end of the second and most vexing of the two trimesters for him, realizing that the improvements proposed to the program hinged largely on his redoubled investment and availability for less than consistent or convenient reteaching, tutoring, and retesting opportunities, we decided to pull him from the third trimester of Integrated One. Tonight, he sits at home on a laptop taking Algebra 1A because he has kept his full course load and completes his math work on his own time, and he plans to take Algebra 1B over the summer, ostensibly redoing freshman math for far more content in his math learning than he was at any point as a student in Integrated 1. Should the district vote to continue with Integrated Math, he will continue to complete his math coursework online under his own direction. Please remember what he had to say about tonight's impending vote. 
That sucks. I'd like to be in a math classroom again. Sure, we, his parents, could trust again and put him back there, but why would we? He was among the first non-advanced college prep ninth graders to take the fiasco that was integrated one. He'll be among the first non-advanced college prep 10th graders to take integrated two, and the first non-advanced college prep 11th graders to take integrated three. I can't and won't trust that the first years of these courses will go any more smoothly than did the first year of integrated one. And I don't want anyone voting tonight to forget that, or my anecdote about my son, no matter the data you've seen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. <clears throat> We have Michael Newmer. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Newmer, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this evening. Uh, my wife and I have four kids who have attended Birmingham Public Schools. We have our last child who's going to be a senior at Sea Home this next year, and we just had a son who graduated from Sea Home on Sunday. I know that you will be voting this evening on the recommendation from the administration to proceed with the purchase of the additional CPM math curriculum materials, and there are two broad points that I would like to make to you. First, I wanted to highlight an answer that one of the teachers gave to a question at the Groves Forum that was held back in February. There are many of us who attended that forum they recall that a certain very well-respected teacher at Seaholm stated at that forum that this curriculum cannot be modified to be a primarily teacher-led program. And if there's any clarification to that, that would be great to hear this evening um, during the discussion. Um, in addition, at the presentation to the board last week, that I think we're going to get to uh, see this evening, there were significant efforts to explain the benefits of a cooperative group-based learning approach. Even though it's stated that the goal is to increase direct instruction, I think it's very important for our community and the board to be clear that what is being voted on this evening is a program that was designed to be taught as a group-based math program. You can't have it both ways. You can't try to sell us on the benefits of a group-based learning program, purchase a group-based curriculum, and then claim it's being taught in a primarily teacher-led fashion. Secondly, I would like to point out some financial considerations related to this decision. I started out my career as a CPA, and I currently own an investment management firm where one of my responsibilities is to analyze financial statements of many different types of organizations. At last Tuesday's board study session, the administration presented you all with a significantly revised budget for this upcoming school year with a projected deficit of $5.8 million. That deficit is in addition to the current year's deficit, the year that we're um, just ending now. That deficit was $2.5 million. So the district is now facing a combined two-year deficit of $8.3 million. At last, night, or last Tuesday's board study session, you were also presented with data regarding the new CPM math program including a cost comparison of three different options for you to consider tonight. As we now know, the option that the administration is recommending comes with an additional cost of approximately $144,000. The question that I'm hoping will be answered during the discussion later this evening is how can you possibly justify spending an additional $144,000 when you are now facing such a massive shortfall? I did see that there was a note in the expenditure resolution that mentions that the cost of this program will be split between the last year, the 2017-18 budget, and this coming year's budget. In my opinion, where these funds are coming from or whether or not they've already been allocated, at this point is really irrelevant given that you're facing a shortfall of this magnitude. Um, after nearly a decade of extremely disciplined cost management by this board and administration, which I think is very commendable, a lot of progress has been made, there have been a lot of costs that have been cut, cut over the years, there are very few controllable, item, controllable spending items left in this district's budget. The cost of the new CPM curriculum material, with obvious, which is obviously a program that many in the community have significant reservations about, 
is one of just a few of the larger discretionary items that you have control over. I look forward to the discussion this evening regarding the expenditure of these funds, and I would recommend that you ultimately decide on a less costly alternative. I thank you very much for your time and, the appreciation, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my concerns. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much for your comments. We're going to... I will have Bob Saad. Good evening, board. Thanks again for listening to me and us. We have some very, very sharp uh, constituents in this district. And the board would do well to, to heed the suggestions of some very, very sharp individuals. The board is scheduled to vote tonight on a resolution that would approve a large expenditure for the continuation of CPM integrated mathematics curricula. In short, moving forward with the CPM curricula at this point would represent a poorly supported educational decision, one, as well as a poor business decision, as Mike just indicated. Point two, again, moving forward at this time with CPM, a CPM curricula would represent a poorly supported educational decision because of, because of the statistics that will be presented today and that have already been presented, as well as a poor business decision, as Mike indicated. From a purely pragmatic perspective, all emotion aside, most of us are relatively neutral about these sorts of things. We're just <laughs> business people that make business decisions like all the rest of you do in your, in, your, in your chosen professions. We're relatively neutral in terms of, of emotion, except when we see such a backlash from the students and the parents. Then we get engaged at a deeper level. Again, from a purely pragmatic perspective, the metrics that would support an affirmative vote are simply not present. Nor have there ever been compelling evidence to support a costly, risky migration away from the previous math curricula towards CPM. The information and statistics that Dr. Hoffman, I presume, uh, will present is not compelling. It is evidence. There's evidence on every side of an argument, but it's not compelling. And your vote today determines whether or not that evidence is compelling or not. I'm saying, and most of us are saying, it's not compelling evidence. Read very carefully pages 29 and 30 of the handout. When you review those statistics for yourself, ask three things. At what cost? Not just a financial cost. At what social cost? At what resource? Other resources. Two, as compared to what other students in the rest of the country? When we compare our students with themselves, that's not, very, that's not a very sound statistical, uh, a statistic to present. We want our students to compete competitively with the rest of the country. So if you're going to present a compelling case for, for the implementation of a new curricula, you have to show, you have to be shown that, that this curricula, these curricula will, will cause our students to be successful against the broader scope of students in the rest of the country. That's the pool that we're looking for. And then number three, where is the hard evidence? As I've said, and I've written to you in emails previously, self-report is not statistically sound. That is the poorest method in most cases of statistical research, self-report. And what you will see in the, in the presentation, uh, in the packet that we have, Self-report after self-report. You, you wouldn't run your own businesses on self-report. I'm asking you not to do that in this situation either. The onus of responsibility is on the administration to provide a compelling case for abandoning the previous curricula in favor of CPM. What we have seen thus far, though, with CPM implementation has proven quite problematic on several fronts, costing the district a significant dollar amount above the status quo with no discernible educational advantage. Again, no discernible educational advantage, which is our goal. Wisdom dictates that curricula that require the volume of support that CPM, 
CPM has shown to require and will continue to require for the foreseeable future, and will continue to require for the foreseeable future, are suspect from the very outset. Moreover, several thousand students would reap the unfortunate consequences of this unnecessary experiment if you vote in the affirmative tonight. Although I deeply respect you as individuals, which you should know by now, uh, several of you I have a deep love for. I'm, uh, Dr. Neerad, I'm very sad to hear that he'll be moving on. Uh, and some of you I've gotten close to over the last couple of years, uh, attending these meetings, etc. Th this has nothing to do with person, uh, a personality. This has everything to do with pragmatism. Again, although I deeply, deeply respect you as individuals who are dedicated to the district, I also believe you should be held accountable if you move forward with this poor decision. As individuals, you are quite talented with successful careers. However, I ask you to reflect on the question of whether or not you have treated this issue with the type of diligence and scrutiny that you would display if it were your own money and resources that you were expending on your own business. I simply cannot see any of you making such a hazardous and far-reaching decision if your own company's success depended on these results. But the stakes are higher. The company, in this case, is my children, of which I have four in this district. The board claims that education is not your specialty, although I, would, I believe Lori would be exempt from this statement. Parents are simply asking and requiring that the board make the same sort of business decisions for the district that you would make for your own businesses. Don't take unnecessary, unnecessary costly, and ill-advised risks. Make informed decisions that involve sources outside of your management and administrative circles. And please do not simply rubber stamp the decisions of the administration. They're wonderful people, but wonderful people sometimes make bad decisions. I ask you to please think through these things intently before you cast your vote on this proposal, and I implore you, vote against further implementation of CPM at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. We're going to move on to Tricia Olvnik. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not nearly as eloquent as the first three speakers. Um, and I, as a parent, am highly focused on the student socio-emotional pillar that Dan really put a lot of effort in when we created our goals in Birmingham. And also, as a parent, I am the first one to call my own child out when maybe they're a little marginal. So on the integrated math front, I really initially supported the idea of this program. And I was probably one of the only people at the Sea Home Forum that thought long-term benefit after we get over some bumps is going to be good for them because they're not going to be regurgitators. They're really going to be learners. The rollout maybe didn't go so good. But I'm seeing that the recovery hasn't been very fruitful, at least for my student. I sadly picked him up at one of the tutoring sessions and found he and other students with no materials out looking at a computer. And when I discussed that, the answer was, you're going to get out of that tutoring what they put in. And you're right, they will. But there's got to be some minimum level of supervision and you should have your materials out. The other point about some of the recovery, um, my son's now in the sixth hour retake. He feels more comfortable in his own skin in that class where it's more teacher-led. And I asked him, how's your regular class going? Still the same as first, second, and third try. I don't think he's doing that much better in the recovery, but at least he's not such an emotional wreck. The sad piece that I've found with this is the collaborative learning piece, which really initially I thought, 
that is what they need. They need to work together because as all of these people who are in business, you work on teams. I don't know if it's because of our affluent community. I, I listen to all these great character ed awards, but I have to wonder, are these just character ed awards and are these kids truly have the empathy for their other students? And I hate to just have to give you my personal piece, but my son was asked to be graded separately from his three teammates. And I understand there's only one group grade. And that was one of my complaints before. It's like, why are you all yelling? There's only one group grade per, per chapter. So, you know, that's, it's not a huge piece. But now he has kind of been shunned out by his group. And I said, well, did you put yourself in that position? He's not the greatest student. He's never going to be an A student. I don't, want, I, I don't need him to be an A student. But I have to have him be comfortable in his environment mm -hmm. and feel safe and not shunned in a way. And I made it clear to him I would not divulge you know, who's who and what's what. But I said, did your teacher know? Yes. Did your assistant teacher know? Yes. And she kind of took the approach I initially did. Did you do this to, your, you know, she basically said, you've kind of done this to yourself. And I asked him, well, how would you have wanted her to respond? What did you need from her? And he said that he needed her to teach him the material. So I do come from more of the emotional side where some of my counterparts that have spoke really have the business aspect part of it down. But the bottom line is, it's the kids that we need to be looking out for. So um, that was part of my comments on that. Um, and just the last piece of it is I was having problems at the very first semester. And I, again, took it that maybe something's wrong with my kid. Maybe he needs to go to a lower math. I had him test it. No, he's appropriate for this level. And there's not another math class we can put him in. And I said, so this is one size fits all. There's no other class he can take. And the answer to me was no. And that doesn't make any sense to me, that it's one size fits all, that there are no other options. And we have such a wide variety of elective courses, which we should pride ourselves on. But if we don't have the right academic courses to fit our students, we're, we're falling off somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, like I'm saying, I'm not, my kid's not looking to get an A. And the reason I put him in the recovery programs because I don't feel comfortable with him going on if he doesn't know the material. I mean, that's the, I'm not the parent that's saying, oh, my kid's not going to get into Stanford. That's not me. He needs to have the skills to get on to the next class, which are requirements to graduate. Um, so anyway, that's my piece on CPM. And the other question or comment I had was, uh, I may have missed information, but I would like to know where the district is in terms of ALICE training for teachers and then rolling out to students. And this is just my little plug, but when we don't foster that socio-emotional side, that's why we need the ALICE training, because it's students coming back having these horrific events in schools. And it's, I can easily see it happening with all of the stress and emotional um, havoc they have in their little minds for such young people. So thank you for your time. Appreciate your time as well. Thank you so much, Tricia. Uh, we will now move on to Vicki. Oh, I'm sorry, Vicki Murmur, M Memmer. <laughs> sorry. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I was one of the parents who went to the Sea Home Parent meeting. Um, and my comments are gonna be very similar to what I said there. Um, this has not been a good experiment, and I know some people don't like when I use that, and I do feel like the kids have been used as guinea pigs. Um, I'm here to voice that I think we should go back to the old curriculum 
Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, Pre-Calc Calculus. I don't think that the recovery band-aids that have been rolled out are working, and I really would be interested to hear how much that has cost the district. I know you've got a lot of teachers spending a lot of time after school, which I appreciate they've done that because my son has appreciated it. But I also know that you're helping with outside tutors, and I know that's adding up. I myself, I'm an engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I went through the old curriculum, and I've taken calculus one, two, three, and four, differential equations. It worked for me. Math is a concrete subject. It is black and white. You need teacher-led instruction that is strong. I do understand, though, at some point, you do want the, t the students to actually speak the steps back to you to show that they are learning the steps. But I don't think that the <coughs> CPM curriculum is the way to go. I see it as a failed attempt. And I did go to the rollout meetings. I could see it in the big picture. I could see what they were trying to do. But this is not working for the students. And I think the students are saying that to you. Um, and I know that the parents said that to you. Like I said, I went to see home and I heard the Groves meeting was even more lively than the see home meeting. So I'm just going to ask, as somebody who's gone through the old curriculum in engineering, it worked. If you could take the kids back to that, Maybe in some future time you could find something else or somehow to do this more collaborative. I still don't see how it works for math, though. Math is just one of those things. You need to learn the steps, and you have to be understanding of how the steps work together and to speak it back to the teacher to show that you've learned it. But I'm here. I saw the email, and I saw the recommendation, and I was shocked by what I saw. So I'm hoping in your vote today that you all think about the students and the parents because the kids and the families have been put through an undue amount of stress this year. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Okay. Next we have Scott Worrell. Um, well, I am, my name is Scott Worrell. I'm the president of the, of the Birmingham Education Association. I'm also a teacher at Groves High School. And you might be thinking that the president of the Birmingham Associate, Education Association isn't going to be speaking about the new math program. Fortunately, I am. Um, and because I need to share with you, as I've been asked to by the teachers that I represent, uh, a study that you've seen that represents a uh, teacher's perspective on this. And I think one of the things that I've noticed since January, since we've had this discussion, um, this is the first time in 21 years when we've had this level of anxiety and this level of um, vo boisterous uh, commentary by parents uh, regarding something that we've done. It's not uncommon that those things happen, right? But not to this degree. And one of the, th the observations that I'm seeing, and I'm a little going off from my speech and I'll get to in a second, is that we're all talking to you or the administration, but we're not talking to each other. That's the, the same theme of that since January. I don't know. I've seen the people that have come here up and speak. They may or may not know uh, of me or, or, or their teachers, but we're not talking. The two parties that are really opposite in this, as I'll explain, completely opposite, is the teachers are 100% behind it. The experts, the people who have studied this, are 100%. Behind. And that's odd that you would get a parents completely against it, for the most part, not all of them. And you don't get teachers, five teachers in the room to agree to something, but 14 teachers that were surveyed on this recommend 100% of them to continue the, pro the, the program. They have no self-interest in it. They think what's best for students. And so I want to explain why, and, and, and these aren't going to challenge what the parents say, um, but they're going to give a, a different perspective for a little bit. Um, I want to be clear that although we have some reservations as teachers about the wording of the resolution, we do support 
uh, the board's passage of this resolution, and the teachers have supported it. Um, and there are a couple of reasons. I think there are five key measurements that are in the teacher survey that uh, are demonstrate why this is best for kids and students from a teacher's professional expect, um, perspective. The first is engagement with new math standards. Um, what we know as teachers is that standards have changed in all of our core curriculums. And the standards of math have changed that require students to work differently and think differently and be problem solvers. We know that. That traditional form of math that we were taught, where we were 30 of us in a room and the teacher lectured about math, and I loved math, I was pretty good in it, even though I became an English teacher and a social studies teacher, that worked for me, didn't, doesn't work for all kids. We know that as experts. That sitting there and learning information and hearing it and regurgitating it back and doing some problems isn't statistically, didn't, wasn't working for us. Our test scores demonstrated that in SAT and PSAT for years. And that's why we went along this route. We know that the college readiness standards and the standards of CPM match. In fact, 95% of the teachers that, so that, all of the teachers said that 95% of the program that they're currently using in CPM, IPM meets those standards, whereas the previous program was only 25% in Algebra 1. Just looking at the standards, it, did not, it doesn't meet what the colleges of University of Michigan, Michigan State are expecting. So the old program isn't an answer. Second data point is uh, what we call student talk or student-student discussions. So in traditional math programs, and traditional is uh, not the right word, teacher-centered may be more appropriate. Um, because all kinds of different traditional programs, that we know as teachers, and we've known this for, for decades, that when students talk to each other about issues and problems, they learn better. We know that as adults, right? If you sit there and listen to something, you can learn a little bit, but when you have to talk about it, and you have to explain it to other people, your brain works in ways that it doesn't work when you're just listening. We know that. And that's why we move to a program like this in which we have student discussion and student talk. And when students resolve problems and figure things out that's problem-based, whether it's in social studies or English and science, and by the way, that's what we've been doing for the last decade, group work, integrated social studies, science, and English, and now we're doing it in math, that students learn from that. Um, and uh, teachers have said that students have to participate in, these, in their classrooms. And we know that under the math program, that we're, that, uh, the new program, 79% of the daily lessons include student discussion and talk. Under the old program, it was only 20%. So if there's that much more student, student talk, that's improving learning. Third thing is individualized instruction. And I think this is where we differ between what direct instruction is and what individualized instruction is and what teacher-led instruction is. Because as teachers, we use those terms and we use them with specific meaning. So if I'm individualizing my instruction to students, I'm doing a better job. Even if I'm working in a group, I'm going around to student to student and working with them. We know that learning occurs best when it's one-on-one -on -one contact with a teacher. If I have a small classroom and I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a student, I can help them learn better because I know they have the questions to ask me. If I'm sitting in front of a class, standing in front of a class and there are 30 students, am I lecturing and asking them to do regurgitate problems? I'm not working on individualized instruction. I'm working on one-size-fits-all instruction, and we know that hasn't worked. And so this program challenged us to do that. And 14 of 14 student uh, teachers surveyed that said under the new program that they, they do this almost every day in which they meet and reach out to students individually and work and smuggle. How are you doing? What's going on? What help do you need? In the old program, that was happening maybe sometimes, a couple of times a week. That's important. Um, demonstrating understanding uh, is, is the fundamental importance. How do students demonstrate their knowledge of the, of the subject? Um, and that means solving problems, not regurgitating information. So we have, in this, the new program requires students to constantly demonstrate understanding on a regular basis. In the old program, or the program that was more traditional, students didn't have to do that. So teachers said they've seen a tremendous increase in students talking about their understanding and being able to communicate that understanding. I want to take a step back, because we, what we've asked students and parents to do is a lot. Imagine your own job. Imagine the work that you would do. You've been asked to do five different things you haven't done before. You've been asked to have a whole new standard at your job, right? That's hard. You've been asked to have conversations and talk with colleagues you never talked before, and you're asked to do that, and you're held accountable for it. That's hard. You've asked to participate more in your job, students more than they've ever before, instead of just sitting there. That's a third thing that's more difficult for kids. 
And you are now, your boss is coming up to you on a regular basis. Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? They're checking it. That's what the teacher's doing. That's individualized instruction. And you're asked to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding of what you're doing in your job all the time. Can you imagine? That's stressful. That would be stressful for any one of us. But that's hard work. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we become better. Sports teachers don't, sports coaches don't say, say, take it easy. They don't say, hey, you know what? We're going to do it easy now. Yeah, it's hard. That's what makes it good. That's what helps kids in the long run. That's why 14 out of 14 teachers believe you should continue this program. It's hard for them, too. Shoot, it's easier to stand up and give a lecture. Any desk, ask a lawyer or any teacher. That's the easiest kind of teaching you can do, because you can repeat the same thing every year. It's much harder to develop lessons like they are doing every day, to rework them every night, to work them individually with students, and to help each individual student. That takes a lot of time and patience and hard work, but that's the good work of education. And I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating for kids. It's frustrating for parents. I hear it. They're, they're, they're honest and forthright. It's frustrating for all of you. It's frustrating for some of us as teachers. But we're improving on the process of delivery of this program. Teachers have seen a decrease in frustration. They've seen an increase in student engagement. They've seen an increase in student aptitude. They become better at teaching through the program. And they've seen students learn and communicate math better. And I, I want to give you one last story. I'm a parent, too. Right? I have two children in a different school district, and they use a math program that the one like we used to use. And I watched my son, who's a 10th grader, struggle with a PSAT. He struggled with the PSAT. He's not a terrible math. He's an A-minus math student in, a, in his class. But he struggled with the PSAT because he had to do word problems. He had to read them and analyze them and figure it out. And he looked at me and said, Dad, I don't get this stuff. We don't have to do it in school. We just fill out the answers on the, on the problem. We just copy down what the teacher says, and then we write out those things. Yes, that's the easy math. But what I saw in his struggle, what I realized that's happening in Birmingham, <coughs> is they're having a good struggle. Because according to, that's the kind of learning that helps kids overcome the deep thinking, the, the, the struggle of deep thinking the resistance to change and learning new ideas and new concepts. So I wish my son was in a program that challenged him more than the one that currently challenges him. I know it's hard, and I know you have a lot of opposition in front of you, but all of the teachers that have worked so hard on this program are 100% behind it. They want what's best in the interest of students. They want students to succeed. They care for these kids as much as any of us do. Give them a chance to continue doing that and let them prove to you all and the parents that this is the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll move on to Kelly Leland. Kelly Lane, I'm a math teacher at Gross, a math one and algebra two math teacher at Gross. Um, I've taught freshman math since the fall of 1997 in three states using a variety of curriculums. And by variety, I really mean like the text and the curriculum noted how they met the state standards, but the content was really pretty similar. Also, they were similar to the textbooks that I learned from several years ago. The presentation has not changed much in over 30 years. Until CPM, I've not been excited about a curriculum, the effect it would have on my kids. There was one semester I taught in Indiana. It lit a fire in my students. It was an integrated math three class. Different publisher, not nearly as well done. But it showed me what a glimpse of student engagement could and should be in my classroom. The CPM curriculum is excellently written and scaffolded to build interest and skills in a way I've never seen before. The storylines are woven throughout the chapters and make it easy to refer back to topics. When I say things about the big race, and they're probably laughing because they know what it is, my kids have a visual of three or four people racing on tricycles. We investigated the speed, the starting position, the winners, when someone was passed up, and all types of other aspects. It taught about y-intercept, it taught about slope, all kinds of things about graphing lines over the course of several lessons. The big race was referred to over and over again as layers and skills were added to this topic. That strong <coughs> foundation is severely lacking 
in a traditional curriculum. I also covered graphing lines in my Algebra 2 class. They were taught this in Algebra 1. They practiced it in geometry. I taught it again in Algebra 2. They didn't have the reference of a big race. Overall, they didn't have the skills. They weren't able to link that math to a story to help it make sense. In addition to graphing lines, another talk topic that I taught in both Math 1 and in Algebra 2 is sequences. My Math 1 students were quick to make the connection between a linear function and an arithmetic sequence. Haven't seen that before. Um, they were able to link together an exponential function, a geometric sequence. When I talked about looking for a starting value, it didn't matter to them if it was linear or arithmetic or exponential or geometric. They understood that that crossed all those different topics. The change, whether it was a function or a sequence, they knew that that crossed all of those different lines and were e easily able to make that transition. That's not the case when I taught it in Algebra 2, starting over again. The phrase, go slow to go fast, has been used countless times in training sessions and meetings that we've been part of while adapting to CPM. We're going much more in depth and building a truer understanding that kids can apply across topics. I believe continuing with CPM will allow sequential courses to cover so much more information better preparing our students for whatever their next steps may be. My Math 1 students recently learned about graphing systems of inequalities. It's another topic that I repeated with my Algebra 2 class, where I spent several days reteaching them the content. The way CPM linked together inequalities and equations, linear to exponential, solutions to exclusions, built seamlessly on the foundation established in so many previous lessons. The kids were able to combine graphing linear inequalities and exponential inequalities and explain the solution. My Math 1 students have a much better understanding of why, not just procedures. A student told me that they preferred the traditional middle school curriculum because it was easier to focus on one topic and then move on. I believe this statement is exactly why we need to keep CPM. It is vital that students are able to apply strategies across topics, actually problem solve, and see how these things are all linked together. Every day, I see light bulbs fire as students make connections. I hear students explain and defend themselves about math. They get excited about math. That's not happening in my Algebra 2 class. With my 20 years of experience, it is my belief that if CPM is rescinded, my students, my kids, and my future students will all suffer. CPM was not an experiment. It was an educated choice made by professionals. Remember my face. Remember my voice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, we will move on to Ann Wind, and that's the final comment. So if there are any others, please do get those over. Wind. Oh, wind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Ann Wind. I teach math at Derby Middle School. I teach two sections of the equivalent ninth grade course. I've done so for the last seven years. So this year I've taught two sections of the integrated one math program. I first want to validate the concerns of those who came before me. I think they're real. I think they're allowed that opposition in their opinion. I come tonight though speaking on behalf and in support of CPM. We should keep CPM as a program and I, want to use the phrase because it's best for students, but I do realize that that's in the eye of the beholder. So let me rephrase. We should keep CPM because it gives students the opportunity to practice skills. Skills that make, that make us proud of them as students who graduate from our district, who move on to attend colleges and universities, who move on to be future employers and future people in life. CPM does teach the students math. CPM is well aligned with the new Common Core State Standards as well as the eight mathematical practices, more so as you heard from Scott Warrow than our previous program ever was. It teaches the students math. If it didn't, 14 out of 14 teachers surveyed wouldn't vote to keep it. It teaches them math rigorously and with rich tasks. But let's talk about the elements of the program itself CPM, as you see it stated in the book, stands for College Preparatory Math. But CPM, the letters, have meaning elsewhere. The M stands for Mixed Space Practice. Mixed Space Practice means that the students cycle back to former concepts from their past. And I don't just mean a month ago. 
sometimes a full year ago, sometimes five, six chapters ago. Is that uncomfortable at first? Absolutely. But what it does for them is it provides them a math toolbox that they're constantly keeping sharp, that they're learning how to keep sharp and keep at the ready that they can dip into. And what a fantastic skill for them to have moving into higher level math, college preparatory exams, standardized tests, and college math in general. The C in CPM also stands for collaboration or cooperative group work. It should also stand for communication in my mind. We have students now that are so prone to electronic communication via keypads, touch screens. This program affords them the opportunity to practice what it feels like to communicate with people face to face. It teaches them how to communicate productively. Does my tone add to the productivity level of my group, or does it take away from it? Some students learn they're not very good at this. It's a struggle for them. Some students learn that they're passionate and they want to defend their reasoning so badly that that aggression actually deflates their group. How are they going to learn this if we don't afford them this opportunity? And like Scott Warrow said, it's hard. It's really hard. And they're not good at it right away. It's uncomfortable. But again, without the ability to practice, how are they going to get better? The P in CPM stands for problem solving or problem-based learning. One of my students' biggest challenges in years past has been their unwillingness to stay in a challenge. Give me the answer. Show me the algorithm. Show me the steps. I just want it done fast. Mm -hmm. This year in May, heads and shoulders above any previous May I've been a teacher, these students not only are willing to stay in a challenge, but they've turned that willingness into being habitual. They've formed habit out of making connections, figuring out different ways to enter a problem, figuring out that the fastest way to solve a problem isn't always the best. They figured out ways where they don't want my help anymore. Never mind, Mrs. Wynn, go away. I don't want your help. So I would be foolish to stand up here and not validate the struggles of this program. I get it. There were hurdles, absolutely. The education, the implementation, we could have done a better job on our end if we're seeing some of the shifts in how this math worked. Absolutely, I 1,000% agree. But just like caving into or settling into that feeling of discomfort that we don't want our students to do, we don't want them giving in, we want to provide them opportunities that make them uncomfortable, have them push through that and learn and grow. That's why you accepting this program to move forward with it is actually showing them by example. Because this year, I know, has been a struggle for all of us. It's been challenging. It's been uncomfortable. We've all felt it. So by pushing through that discomfort and, and showing our students that, hey, yeah, it was challenging, and we're going to work through it. We're going to keep it because this program is everything we want our students to be. People who call on previous knowledge. People who proactively and productively communicate. Doers, thinkers, they're engaged. They're problem solvers, they're solutionists. My students are solutionists and they don't even know what that means. <laughs> so I encourage you to keep this program moving forward because of the benefits it provides for our students, regardless of its challenge and discomfort. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you all for your public comments. Um, I know that uh, everything that is shared has been taken to heart. I think everyone at this table right here, we listen, uh, we've heard. Um, so I do appreciate you taking the courage to stand up and share uh, such personal stories as well uh, on your viewpoints on this. All right, we are going to move on to our report section. Uh, Dan, do you want to kick sure. that off? I, I will do that. And I just want to echo the same things around the various perspectives that have been shared. And there will obviously be more discussion uh, through the evening about this particular um, program and our recommendation. I wanted to um, take just a, a brief amount of time to provide an overview of our advanced learning opportunities in the district. 
And I want to do that because I believe uh, unintended, we've created some confusion about what, what is the district's commitment to these courses. And what I want to be able to say, and it's really important for me to, to, to say this through this report, is that there's a strong commitment to these courses. And when um, both the science curriculum and the math curriculum were revised, there was a recommendation to have in each two less honors courses. Those were separate decisions that were made through the curriculum planning process. Um, one uh, related to both for math and science uh, with the rigor of these new curriculum, and that's part of what we just heard through some of the testimony. This is a rigorous curriculum, and it was really thought that if all kids are in that more rigorous curriculum, was that honors course needed? And then in addition for science, it was to look at a, an opportunity to create quicker access into advanced placement programming. So there was a rationale, and it was too much at one time. And so there, uh, there was a decision that I made to, uh, as part of this ongoing discussion related to math and science to reinstall those courses, and that's what the intention is going forward. I had also recommended that there be a task force convened and I believe there still be some, might be some merit, but that's obviously up to the new superintendent to make that judgment. Because if we continue as a district to look curriculum group by curriculum group, we may not have the best overarching philosophy about what these courses should consist of and when they should be offered. But that's for another decision to make at another time. But more important is I don't want to leave this work with a view that there was an intention to reduce and minimize these learning opportunities. And that's why I asked Deb to put a brief report together just to highlight what these consist of now. So Deb Goldnitz, one of our curriculum coordinators, take us through this, please. Thank you very much. And this will be very brief, I promise. Um, but being part of the Minority Student Achievement Network, which is the national organization that we participate in, there has been a focus this year on what we can do to help all students have access to advanced learning opportunities. And I feel that in Birmingham, we have a wonderful array of courses across our content areas. So what you're going to see this evening really is just a quick overview of what we have for honors level studies as well as for advanced placement studies. So in the secondary level specifically, we have honors classes available in all of our core content areas. And at the middle school, that includes mathematics. In looking at more deeply what the honors uh, courses look like at the high school, from the lists that are going to go before you, you can see that in each of the core content areas, there are multiple courses from which students can select. Um, and these are listed in our high school course selections catalogs. But in English, there is a large array of quest of course options, mathematics, social studies. In English and social studies combined as interdisciplinary studies, you are familiar, I'm sure, with the two programs that we have in the two high schools. At Groves, that is called um, the Excel program. And at Seaholm, that is the Flex program. Flex is an honors program that begins in grade 9 and runs all the way through grade 12. At Groves, that has taken a different look at different times, but currently, we are running that at grade nine as a pilot, which will be coming um, with a full interdisciplinary study review in the fall to be adopted as part of uh, the course offerings going forward. And grade 12 is being considered as well. So both of those schools will have, both of our high schools, um, will have options for interdisciplinary honors level studies. In the sciences and world languages, we have um, lots of options there. In world language, it begins at the fourth level of study of any one particular course, one particular language. And as you know from review that has just recently been done, we offer the perspectives class as an honors course beyond level four in Spanish. And we'll be adding that in French and Chinese. At the middle school level for mathematics, just a quick look at these, you can see that anywhere from 35 to 40 percent of our students participate in honors level at math, in mathematics at the middle school. Um, and if we were to think about percentages going into the high school, um, we have a slide that we're going to look at that is more about seats, and I'll explain that. But um, we, it would be safe to say that about a third of our students do participate in honors classes. <clears throat> in terms of AP, advanced placement courses, 
These courses all lead to the option for students to take an AP exam. They do not have to take an AP exam, but those go across our core content as well as elective areas. So you can see that in the business department, and we heard from some of those students tonight, um, that do sometimes take some of those higher level computer programming classes, those are AP classes, all the way down to art studio and music, as well as in our academic areas. And there are many of those offered to our students. But if we think about um, students doing advanced learning, and this slide, I just want to talk through it with you for just a moment. It looks a little bit odd. 11.1 percent of all available seats are used for advanced learning. Let me explain that to you. So at Sea Home, we have approximately 1,400 plus students. Those 1,400 students each have 15 course sections every year. So if we think about 1,400 students sitting in 15 seats each, now we are talking about over 21,000 seats available. Are you following what I'm saying? So in other words, I'm a student, but I take 15 different sections of classes every year. So in a year, there are over 21,000 seats available. If we look at the number of students taking honors or AP, that adds up to 11% of those seats. And then at Groves, we're looking at 10% of those seats. But if we were to look at individual students, we're probably more at about a third of the population or more. The number of AP students um, in our district is very high. And this number is based on 20, spring 2017, only because spring 2018 just happened. And like PSAT, all the data that comes out of College Board isn't to us until July. Parents can get individual scores earlier. We cannot get them until July. So the spring 2017 AP exams in our district, there were 308 students at Groves and 452 students at Seahome who took advantage of taking an exam. Remember that students do not have to take an AP course to take an AP exam. And they can take an AP course but do not have to take the AP exam. If they do take the exam, they have the option of getting either college credits for that course or waiving the course and taking something else in its place. All of that depends on each of the college and university's own policies around accepting AP credits and how many for each student will be accepted. Generally, the cut point for beginning to receive waivers or credits is at a level of three, a score of three out of five. So of our 308 students at Groves who took AP exams last spring, they took a total of 602 exams, and those were across 34 different subjects. Okay, so I'm pointing this out to you because if you were to look at the list of AP courses and add them up, and then look at the courses, uh, the exams taken, you would say those numbers don't match. But remember, you don't have to take the course to take the exam or take the exam if you take the course, okay? So if we look again at the number of students that scored really well, and we're talking about the number of um, tests taken, okay? So at Groves, over 76% of those tests were three or higher, and at Seahome, over 73%. So our students do exceptionally well in AP and honors areas. This particular slide is just giving you some trends of how we are doing. Um, from 2013 through 17, there's a five-year um, list there of trends of number of students taking AP exams. Again, that's not the number of students taking AP courses. One student at one high school might take three or four AP courses in a year. One student might take one. So it's really hard to equate number of students to number of courses or tests. And you can see how we are scoring in, at the level of three or higher also over time. Our scores are much higher than the Michigan or the global scores. So this just gives you a quick overview. And if we think about the mission that was read by one of our middle school students, we really are making sure that our students have educational excellence available to them, that they reach those high levels so that they can positively impact their world. Deb, thank you very much. Board, are there any questions at all with the presentation or anything that you have for Deb? Yes. I just want to go back to that available seats statistic. Um, is it 
ever possible to get 100%? Are there enough AP and um, honors courses <coughs> such that one student could fill all 15 sections with AP and honors? The reason I ask is because if the answer to that is no, then I don't understand what this percentage uh, represents, what it means. Because it'll it's, never be 100. It will never be 100, correct, because we don't have an AP or honors health class, which is required, or an AP or honors physical education class, which is required, so no. Um, the purpose of that was simply to see at what level, at what percentage of time are our seats being used for AP so it or should, honors. The part of the whole, so the whole should be, you know, maybe out of 13 courses per student or 12 or whatever, you know, the number of courses, right? You make a good point, yes. I was trying to find a way of letting you see the volume. No, I, I, I and, I, and there is, a, it's a challenge mm -hmm. because students can take multiple APs, multiple honors, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then you started off your presentation by noting that we're a member of a multicultural student organization. The Minority Student Achievement Network, yes. Um, but this presentation doesn't include any data breakdown um, by demographic. Correct. And so um, do you, are there goals around um, increasing representation yeah. across various demographic groups? We've been working through that with our work in the Minority Student Achievement Network to look at best practices, to visit other districts, to hear what is happening. We have not specific, set specific goals yet in Birmingham. Okay. I only brought that to your attention because it has been a focus of mine over this past year, along with Dr. Hitchcock, if, as we've been attending those meetings. That, that will be a significant focus with Deb, but in particular with Dr. Hitchcock, because the goal is to create more opportunity for this type of learning. And the reality of it is, while the, that wasn't the focus of the report tonight, because tonight I wanted to be able to show the range of mm -hmm. courses. Mm -hmm. That was my, my, my hope and goal here. But the reality of it is there is disproportionality in participation with certain subgroups in the district, and that has to be looked at. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that you automatically tomorrow start placing kids in these courses, but how do you build a path for all kids or more kids to take our most rigorous courses and you start at elementary building into middle school and into high school. So that needs to be, and, and, and Jamie particularly understands the importance of that focus. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I, I understand your point, uh, you know, Dr. Nirad, but I, I, I've had some concerns about this as well. Um, and, and as I listen to uh, conversations around integrated math and uh, I can't remember the, the parent's name but she said that what happens to the non-advanced student right. or that student that's not excelling and that really resonates with me um, and as we look at this um, you know I've had conversations with parents and I've even asked this question as a, as a board member surrounding our philosophy as it relates to honors in AP mm -hmm. and I'm struggling right now to really understand what is our philosophy and I would like to have some input possibly on what is our philosophy um, what is our overall arching principles how, how are we structuring um, integrated math or uh, English or social studies science you name it what is our philosophy around honors and, and, and if any feedback will help me because I, I'm really struggling with that right now. Well, and I, and I can say to you that was the intention of that task force and I'm hoping that that can be revisited at some point in time because we go curriculum group by curriculum group and say there should be a course here, there shouldn't be a course here, but what you miss in that approach is that overall philosophy and I, I agree with you. I don't think the district currently has one. We have, a, the good news is we have an array of um, very advanced courses and we have a lot of kids participating in them, but what's the goal behind that? What are we trying to accomplish? And those are questions that beg answering as you, as you continue to do work in the district. I am so sorry to interrupt. Can I just add something to this? <laughs> um, we have at the high school, all the department chairs, some of them sitting here, a goal to address the achievement gap. 
And so um, each department chair at C. Holman, I'm sure the same happens at Groves, we meet regularly, weekly, and we touch base about those very things. For example, this is just one example, the English and the Social Studies departments this year did exactly what you're talking about. We examined the, the data of our students in honors courses, and then we looked at our minority students, and we examined their data, and we asked ourselves the question, why are some of our students not enrolling in the honors and AP classes? And so we brought together some students in a focus group with the department chairs and some other students who, of my, the minority students who were in the AP classes, and we talked to those students about enrolling and the benefits of enrolling and encouraged them to enroll. And we've been doing this for like the last four years. And so I have data that our current seniors who are graduating, we do have more students in English and social studies, uh, minority students who are in our AP classes and have done extremely well. I, you know, we tracked their, their grades. And so we do that. I just wanted just to add that. I'm sure that was totally out of decorum. I apologize for that. But I just, it's really hard to bite my tongue on this kind of thing. Because it is just so important at, um, at, our, at all our schools, I know, but it's in particular. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I would add one piece um, that I was going to mention earlier, that from sitting on multiple curriculum uh, leadership teams and curriculum action teams, each time we come to review, we ask the question about access to high rigor for all students. And that's always at the top of our list, along with a review of our strategic plan and our learning profile for students, our student profile. And it is about giving access to all students, which is what the Minority Student Achievement Network is helping me to better understand and better focus on. But there have been many conversations about various avenues to that. Integrated math is an example of putting those students together who can thrive from one another. We've had similar conversations in English content areas about um, offering options to earn honors credit within the same classroom as all student learning so that everyone is getting that same access and that same rigor. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on uh, to Joe, who will do a presentation on the CPM integrated math. Uh, Dan, is there anything that you would like to uh, There is. Share? I mean, there is, and it, it'll be very brief, and, and I'll have some other things to share later on. But just want to uh, point out that the integrated math curriculum was approved in January of 2017. And so that was one action. The, the uh, Board of Education did approve the implementation of the curriculum. The only other action that was formally taken by the board relative to the curriculum, and at that time approved the resources as well, but there was a mo that motion in, um, to rescind the resources in a very recent board meeting for integrated math two and three pending our review of the first year of implementation and pending our recommendation. And that's where we are, are tonight. So we have completed our review. Um, and what I particularly ask for is this review is being done. Uh, and I know there are different perspectives that exist regarding any particular study, but I felt it was important that we uh, demonstrate what does this curriculum align to? And why is it important that a curriculum like this or any curriculum, whether it was in math or not, is aligned to the current standards. Because I believe, first and foremost, that must be demonstrated in terms of any curriculum that comes before the Board of Education. We also wanted to include achievement data. We wanted to make sure we were including input from students and teachers. So yes, there is some uh, self-reporting, but I think that's very important data that we have as this issue is being considered. We did frame up three different proposals. And we do have our administrative recommendation. And without going into any de further detail now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hoffman to walk us through this report. All right, thank you, Dr. Nerad. And good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing us to uh, take a few minutes to share an overview, big picture of uh, college preparatory math, otherwise called uh, CPM or integrated math. And I just want to thank our teachers for being here tonight, as well as our department heads, uh, Thad Wilhelm and uh, Stuart Kane. And uh, Michelle Tyndall, who is our coordinator for, for math and science, and as well as our parents, too. I, I appreciate perspectives on both sides. And my presentation tonight, I'll try to be very factual in nature, 
uh, and hopefully accomplished what Dr. Narrett asked uh, to put together here. So you reviewed these materials at our study session. We took a deep dive during that time. So I'm going to move uh, fairly quickly through some. I'll slow down at some points, add more details, and you may have questions as we uh, go along too. So tonight, uh, as Dr. Naird mentioned, we'll be talking about alignment. We'll be talking about the rationale for changing to a program, a CPM. We'll touch on again, uh, Ann Wind had mentioned that, uh, the pillars of CPM. We'll just touch base on those again. We'll talk about uh, what instructional adjustments that we've made, what data do we have so far to, uh, to shed light on those adjustments, and then, of course, as Dr. Nair had mentioned, proposals and recommendations and, and budget implications. Okay. So for starters, just a quick review of where we were and where we've gone. Our former program was Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and we've moved to the Integrated Math 1, 2, and 3, preserving the honors uh, classes between, between the two. As I start in this section, how do we align curriculum? And I could stand up here and talk about the same process with English language arts. I could talk about it with science, with social studies, with art, with uh, physical education. This is the lens that we pass all our curriculum reviews through to see what the alignment it looks like. And this is probably the most important part of the conversation. How does this program align to our district, uh, district points? So for starters, our district mission, uh, that's tied to our uh, strategic plan, uh, specifically around goals one and two that talk about uh, learning for uh, students, rigorous approach to learning, and again, for all students. Uh, there was a, another piece of the alignment, our BPS math vision that was developed by our math teachers. Really quick to point out a few points on that. It's for all students. It's high levels of achievement for students, learning progressions, as well as making those connections between <coughs> mathematics and, and the real world. I'm going to slow down here just a little bit because this is the, probably the most important slide in the alignment. State of Michigan has changed the standards. I've been in this business for 30 years, and there's been lots of renditions of what students need to be able to know and be able to do. So these standards are very different. On the one side, on the left-hand side, our content standards. Those are our standards we're all familiar with. Uh, we've all learned probably math that way. Uh, it's made up of a set of, uh, of uh, standards, conceptual categories. On the right-hand side is very different, though. That is the standards for mathematical practice. We are asking our students to do something very different than we were ever asked to do in our, in our math classes. And if I just point out a few of the mathematical practices, make sense of problems, preserve, uh, persevere in solving them. Construct viable, viable agreements, critique reasoning of others, attend to precision, as well as the other ones that are there. So again, that is new in the state of Michigan uh, standards. A little bit deeper dive in the standards, you'll see some of those topics are very familiar. Quantities, number systems, uh, vector and uh, matrix quantities, uh, trigonometric functions, those are the standard mathematics content uh, that we learned when we were, in, we were in school. Something new, however, is related to modeling. The new standards ask our students to model their mathematics, to apply them to real world problems, and then also make sense of those problems and persevere in, in solving those. Uh, so that's new for these standards. A little bit deeper dive, when you mention exponential models or exponential notation to most students, or quadratic equation, that usually sends a chill up most parents and, and students' backs. Uh, if you look toward the bottom, I know it's in fine print, we're asking students not only to know those terms and solve problems, but be able to apply those to real life uh, situations. Again, asking much more of our students than, than we were ever asked. There are resources out in the public that take a look at uh, resources, independent review of resources. Ed Reports is one of those companies. Independent, uh, non-for-profit, they typically look at English language arts books and mathematical textbooks, and they weighed in on the different resources that we uh, were using and what we've chosen. Uh, Pearson now owns uh, Prentice Hall, so when they look at their traditional uh, uh, Pearson mathematics book, the focus and coherence to the standards fall, fall very, very short. And, and that's because, again, those previous books were made for a different type of standards. These standards are new. Uh, Ed Reports didn't even review the mathematical practices because it fell so woefully short in terms of the, the content. 
When you look at uh, college Joe, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. But Dan. we don't have the advantage of the the PowerPoint on the monitor. Okay, Dan, can you? Uh, no, I mean he's got a. Te I checked with him earlier. He had a technical problem, right? But I just my point is, can you just point out? Periodically, so we're on the same page with you. Okay, your... I'm sorry about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, you didn't yeah. know that. And I know the board does have uh, full-size copies of the presentation too. Hopefully, that's that's helpful. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so back over to the alignment uh, with Pearson Traditional. That just shows the graph of the red mark is kind of halfway on the on the screen there in the slide, just showing that it does not meet uh, very well to match the content standards. Uh, the next slide is the alignment to the CPM program. Uh, very high alignment to the content standards, extremely high alignment to the mathematical uh, practices. Again, this is independent reports. This is a slide, type of slide that I'm going to stop at after a number of the alignment sections. And this is a comparison of the two programs. So as you look at our former program, uh, Algebra 1, there's minimal emphasis on the standards for mathematical practice. There is a focus on skill practice and single strategies for solving problems. However, there is minimal connection between multiple representation ways of solving problems. And there is a lack in some of the standards related to data analysis, probability, and statistics. On the right-hand side with the CPM program, uh, yes, the mathematical practice standards incorporated in every lesson. There's multiple strategies, as you heard from our teachers earlier, for solving problems, multiple ways of representing problems. And this mathematical modeling is presented, uh, presented throughout. Another piece of alignment that we look at in any type of curriculum is our learner profile. Our learner profile comes from our framework for global competencies. There's uh, six of those. And that stems from our strategic plan also, talking about our future ready students. I've pulled out two examples of those, critical thinkers, questioners, and problem solvers, uh, communicators, and collaborators. And when you compare programs between those two, you'll see that with the uh, the old program, sure, follow a line of thinking, support a position, a way of solving a problem, conveying ideas, seek understanding. The new program uses those rich past critiquing, applying multiple strategies, uh, speaking skillfully, reasoning with evidence, persevering and persisting, solving real world problems. A very different match in terms of, of types of curriculum. Another type of alignment document we look at has to do with the five dimensions for teaching and learning. That happens to be our uh, instructional framework for our district and also the document and framework we use for teacher evaluation. So in that, there's five dimensions and I pulled out, I pulled out really just three to take a look at. Student engagement, you heard earlier from our teachers around student talk. This idea of talk that's centered around intellectual thinking and having higher level thinking related to uh, communicating about math. Another piece has to do with uh, curriculum and pedagogy. And if you take a look down toward the bottom, scaffolds for learning. That's the idea that presenting very tough problems to students, providing support over time, releasing that support and giving more ownership to students uh, as they develop mastery with that. And really, uh, student independence. The last one of the dimensions I want to point out in my three examples has to do with classroom environment. The idea at the bottom, classroom culture, for discourse and interactions between students. Very high expectations for that. And then the classroom norms should encourage risk taking, collaboration, and respect for thinking. And that is happening in our uh, CPM classrooms. Again, that familiar slide of comparing the two programs. The former program, yes, does focus on procedural understandings. Uh, does support the learning targets and certain teaching points. There's a lot of modification that has to happen with the old program in terms of meet, meeting those other uh, areas related to the five dimensions. The new program, yes, rigorous intellectual work, scaffolds for learning, strong linkage between units and lessons, multiple representation, it's research-based instructional practices, and the idea of students taking ownership for their learning is very, very powerful in terms of, in terms of achievement. The last document I want to talk about in terms of alignment has to do with our district SMART goal. That's a relatively a new version of that just in this past year. I know we had a board a learning session where Dr. Golens and I presented that. Uh, primarily, the new district SMART goal is having our students be college and career ready. And the measures we're using the, for those are the NWA, the PSAT, SAT, as well as MSTEP, which is the State of Michigan Assessment. In terms of looking at mathematics, those uh, assessments have changed. 
Back in the old days, it was a set of problems, working through the problems, picking the multiple choice answer. The PSAT, SAT, and the MSTEP these days, it's all about application, understanding a situation, solving tough problems, and uh, coming up, obviously, with the correct solutions for those. So even the district SMART goal aims toward a much more a rigorous curriculum. In comparison to the two program, again, former program, computational skills has that covered. It, however, it's not reflective of the new assessments that are out there. It's also not matched with our learner styles that we're aiming for in terms of our instructional approach and really limited capability for the new measure of college and career readiness. Uh, CPM, in contrast, focus on problem solving skills, very reflective of the new assessments. It uh, does promote growth and high achievement for learners of all levels, and it does promote college and career readiness. High marks. At this point, let's take a look at uh, why did we make the change? So I'm shifting now from the alignment framework we look at to, okay, why did we make the change? I'm on the page now that shows the rationale for the former algebra program. A plus means a high match, a check mark means some match, minus means low or no match. So as you look through the previous program in terms of district mission and down the line, there's a lot of places where there's very low or very low match to those. In some cases, yes, there's, there is some match. It does meet some of the state of Michigan standards. It does meet some of the five dimensions. And in some ways, uh, it meets some of the SMART goals, but certainly not high matches to those. As we take a look at the uh, new program, uh, there's plus marks down the whole page there. And you might say, Joe, did you just copy paste all the way down the slide and you're trying to point out, you know, maybe a dramatic difference? I can tell you that a number of us have spent a long time over each one of these in terms of was, whether it was a low match, some, or high match. And yes, indeed, the new CPM program meets high marks across all of those, all of those alignment areas. And that's, that's very, very important. The next piece I want to mention, and I do want to spend a, a few minutes on this, has to do with achievement data. Yes, we do look at studies, and studies come in the form of uh, direct studies around uh, CPM, come around direct studies around integrated math, because there's lots of different types of integrated math programs out there, and then also looks at the foundational research of what makes these programs. And I, I want to say that this is scientific research-based uh, studies that were looked at, and in those achievement trends, uh, there were very significant high achievement trends across that. We did take a look at California uh, high schools. And California has an option of, in their high schools, traditional math or integrated math. And I was able to get a list of the performance of the CPM using math high schools in California. And out of those number of students, when you compare their growth, and this in terms of scaled scores mm. for those, when you compare them to who was using CPM for three years, and those compared to like all the California students in one bucket, is that there was increased growth in scale scores uh, with, those, with those CPM using high schools. I also dug deeper. I was challenged by a number of parents and also the superintendent. Okay, so what do schools that look like us, how are they performing? So one example I pulled out of Coronado High School in California, A-plus district just like us, low free and reduced lunch. What they saw over the case of three years is students that were in the standards met and exceeded categories, that increased from 50 to 60%. Again, that's one high school, one that looks like ours. There's you know, thousands of high schools in California. But I wanted to point out that there, there is evidence showing that, that this makes a difference in, in high schools. There is some additional rationale. I won't spend too much time on these slides uh, relative to uh, CPM. And we've mentioned some of those already, or our teachers have mentioned those. I do want to stop on this slide and point out that the middle bullet, that we believe students will be better prepared for state and national assessments, university courses, real world applications with CPM. And I do want to point out that CPM is, is not a new experimental program. It's been used by 4 million students over the past, over the past 20 years. The next set of slides, uh, and Ann Wind actually talked about this a little bit, so I'll just skim through these slides. What is really CPM? We've heard a lot about what it isn't, what we don't like about it, but CPM is really built on a strong foundation. I'll just, just review those again for you. The one piece of focus on real world problems, Student, students benefit from problem-based learning. The research is listed there, foundational research of why this is, 
This is good for achievement. Now, I'll just point out, what is it? Working on rigorous problems together to develop understandings with a procedure for solving them rather than practicing a procedure after being told by the teacher. And if you think about that last part of the phrase, isn't that a lot of the ways we learn math in high school and middle school? Here's the procedure, follow the procedure, do 30 problems for homework. The second pillar of CPM is students benefit from mixed space practice. And again, what that means is having students experience both curriculum and review, or experience both current and review problems during classwork and homework that are spaced out over short and long periods of time. This idea that these, these uh, topics recirculate and come back and get reinforced over time is very important. The third piece for uh, CPM, yes, students benefit from collaborative learning. A lot of foundational research around that. The U.S. Department of Education uh, defines that. Students of different abilities working in small teams with a variety of learning, ability, learning activities to improve their collective understanding of a topic. Again, that's one of the foundational pieces of, of CPM. So moving on to the next section, uh, so what did we learn and what did we do? And I agree, the implementation fell short of our, of our students' expectations, our parent expectations. One of our uh, teachers mentioned fell short of their expectations too. But I can tell you that we sincerely listened and we made uh, a number of adjustments. The items up on the screen there, I don't necessarily need to go through because I think we're well familiar. We did a lot of messaging around that uh, in terms of what was happening in the classroom, what was happening outside the classroom, what supports were put in place. Uh, to help support our students. And then also, what additional work were we doing with our teachers uh, on the program, too? So the question of the day is, did the adjustments make a difference or not? I do want to point out this is early evidence. A good researcher uh, would say that you have to have multiple pieces of data before you have you know, firm decisions around if something is statistically significant. Okay, so what I'm presenting to you is early data that sheds light on those, those interventions that we did. So the first, Pete, is taking a look at our grade trends. And keep in mind that during the school year, if you even think back to your own uh, math classes, the rigor of math does increase more and more and more as the school year goes by. So what we see in terms of uh, grades, right now we see about 60% of our students earning an A or B. I did note when I looked at the students' grades right now that there's a number of students that have missing assignments or tests to make up or incomplete assignments. And that's part of the nature of this time of school year is students are working on getting those tests made up, getting, getting those assignments in. So when you take a look at, on the right-hand side of the slide, one of the questions on our student survey was, what, what do you think your grade is right now? And 76% of our students self-reported that they were currently earning an A or B. So they must have confidence in themselves that they're going to get those tests made up, those, those assignments uh, complete. I do want to point out that uh, Thad Wilhelm, at the beginning of the school year, had done a, a statistical analysis of our first trimester uh, CPM grades and our first trimester algebra grades from last year. And he found that there was no statistically, okay, words chosen carefully, statistical difference between what the math grades were for algebra starting the year and the, and the CPM grades. Granted, though, even though they weren't statistically different, we did see some more students on kind of the D and the, and the E range. And that was part of the reason why we put some of these uh, interventions in place. But statistically, the grades were, were the same. I want to pause here for a second to actually take a little more time on, on this slide. This is results from our NWEA. And just being sensitive to our, our parent comments uh, that, that I heard earlier, I do want to point out where this data came from and why we don't have data for our ninth grade students. Our ninth grade students don't take NWEA uh, for math or for reading. Our eighth grade students do. Typically from kindergarten through eighth grade, that's where we use NWEA. At the high school, we use larger measures, PSAT, SAT, uh, AP scores, uh, et cetera. And this was uh, what I was able to say. When I look at our students that are in middle school advanced math, there was a concern that we might be harming our most able students. When I looked at their performance on NWA last year, fall to spring, and then this year from fall to spring while they're in uh, CPM, here's what I found. I found that this year an average RIT growth rate of about 3.93 compared to last year for those same students of 2.95. So what do those numbers mean? They seem like relatively small numbers close together. On the side of the slide, 
uh, I pointed out that when you look at the NWA norm curve for how students perform at different grade levels and what RIT scores that they get, a RIT change of about 1.5 to 2.0 for where those highly able students are operating, that's almost two years of growth for them this school year. They grew a lot last year, and guess what? They grew a lot more this year. And that was as a result of looking at, again, the same cohort of students last year and this year. Uh, one other question just being sensitive to our, our, one of our parent concerns, of where is the PSAT data for ninth grade? Our eighth graders and our ninth graders take PSAT. They took the same assessment, PSAT 8-9, at different times in the spring. In the early spring, uh, our eighth graders took it. We got those results back fairly quickly. And one of our parents mentioned that if you go on the, uh, the website with your students' uh, credentials, you can go in and see what those, what those scores are. And uh, however, we did get the uh, district level reports for our eighth graders. Our ninth graders, controlled by the state of Michigan, even though they took that test weeks ago, the state of Michigan holds on to those scores until they've done all their accountability studies. And believe me, I've asked uh, Dr. Goldnitz once, twice, three times, four times, five times, can we get our ninth grade PSAT scores? Cannot cannot get them from the College Board or from the state of Michigan. I do look forward to looking at, at those data. What I can say about the eighth grade data, that when we look at our advanced level students, uh, they average about a 525 on that spring uh, PSAT 8-9. And that means that all but six of our students reached the cut score of 430. Uh, and that's compared to the average score, if you put all our eighth grade students all in one bucket, the average score for them was uh, 473. Joe, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I was looking at Deb's presentation moments ago, and I was looking at middle school advanced mathematics um, from BCS to Berkshire to Derby. We're looking at around 35 to 40 percent that are uh, participating or considered advanced or, as you stated, the most able students. Sure, yeah. Um, what that leaves is, is roughly 60 to 65 percent of our students that are not advanced or most able students. Yeah, that's correct. And I am really interested to hear uh, what we have done to better understand uh, that 60 to 65 percent student growth. Okay. So one piece is taking a look at uh, data. We're, you know, we're waiting on that data. Also, too, that uh, you heard from our, our teachers, uh, Kelly Leland, for example, that has uh, really those students uh, in, in her classroom. And she talked about the, the attention to what students were learning, making those adjustments for students, and, and really doing individualized work, work with those students. So if you're asking uh, for specific data, again, we can take a look at uh, class grades. We have to wait on the PSAT. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the NWA data for that. Have so, we done any research, or do we have any data to um, reference class grades for that subgroup? Or that 60, actually, I would say that's probably majority, so the 60%. Yeah, I don't know if uh, uh, Michelle or Stuart, you can talk about that, or maybe one of our teachers. Uh, I do know, maybe I should just answer that directly, is that, uh, you know, our algebra students last year, maybe Michelle, you can help me out, was that comparison of scores, <clears throat> was that for uh, uh, al high school algebra students, or was that for... Okay, yeah, so it's... Yes, yeah, so it was that particular subset yeah. of, of groups are students that were taking you repeat that in ninth so grade. up on the microphone? Right. Pardon me? Just repeat that. So yeah, I'll just repeat. Is that uh, uh, Thad Wilhelm's study was uh, a five years of Algebra 1 performance compared to this year's uh, CPM 1, and that was for our high school ninth grade, ninth grade students. So, again, to answer your question more directly, uh, we still have more work to do in terms of looking at specific results. Uh, we hope to have that have that soon. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving now, uh, another piece of data that we looked at had to do with our uh, teacher survey. I'll move a little bit quicker through those. As our teachers looked at the previous program compared to the new uh, uh, CPM program, in terms of content standards, uh, both had relatively high marks to that, although CPM uh, scored a little bit higher in terms of our teachers' eyes. However, during during a look at our mathematical practices, our teachers recognize that the old curriculum does not align well to those, and certainly the new curriculum uh, does. One other piece, too, is talking about how students engage with the new uh, mathematical practices. 
And they pointed out that with the old program, not much engagement. With the new program, uh, quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit engagement. Our next slide here takes a look at uh, student engagement, uh, how it increased with the college preparatory uh, math curriculum. The specific question was, to what extent has the level of engagement changed as part of the implementation of the CPM math program? Compared to the Algebra One program, our teachers are seeing great student engagement uh, around the new CPM program. Uh, the next slide has to do is what shifts have you seen in students in terms of their uh, participation, individualized instruction, differentiation, and demonstration of understanding. So our teachers are seeing quite a shift in terms of what our students know and are able to do as a result of, of CPM. This slide is interesting because we'll compare it to what student perceptions are. This is a perception from a teacher's seat in terms of students' level of frustration uh, from the beginning of the year till now. And you can see that there's about a 45.4% difference between where we start at the beginning of the year to where teachers see their students uh, here at the end of the year. And the last uh, slide relative to some graphs uh, from our teacher survey, our, uh, Scott War pointed this out, all of our teachers are in support of continuing this program. 100% of them are uh, very passionate. They believe this is the, uh, the right direction for students. The next couple slides I'll just <clears throat> point out uh, just for reference. I won't read anything on these, but these are the comments from teachers relative to uh, the integrated math program. And then also our teachers uh, provided for your review, uh, either you did this already or, or later, relative to student success stories. They've really made a difference in our students relative to uh, CPM. I'm going to shift now to our uh, <clears throat> student survey. And we had about 83% of students uh, complete this survey. Uh, good proportions from all of our uh, buildings. And I want to point out that uh, the first piece is showing satisfaction with CPM compared to the beginning of the year. This compares to slide 42 that I just touched on just a second ago. Our students, we've seen a shift, not much of a shift from the beginning of the school year. And uh, how you personally feel about your math class, you know they, they still like how math was taught last year. The next slide on here is as they reflected on their PSAT test that they took, did they see similarities in questions? Yes, they did. Almost half our students reported that they saw questions very similar to the, the PSAT. The next question has to do with in terms of how we're discussing math in classrooms. Uh, with teachers and other students. <clears throat> Almost half of our students said that they're spending more time this year in math conversations than uh, than previous year. This is a slide I really want to pause on for a second. I really want to talk about this. This is a slide that shows about how their confidence and specific math skills have changed compared to the beginning of the year. And these are our students self-reporting that they're feeling that they're listening, responding to math ideas more. They're using graph tables and equations, uh, having more confidence with that. They're having more confidence sticking with difficult problems. And they're having more confidence solving uh, difficult problems also. And if you think back to Anne and Kelly as they talked about uh, their classrooms, they're seeing the same thing from a teacher's eye uh, in their classrooms. The next slide here talks about uh, does their grade reflect what they know and can do? About 54% of students said that, yeah, yeah, it does. This is an important slide, too, because we made some adjustments in the amount of uh, whole class direct instruction compared to the beginning of the school year. And here's how students reported on this. They report about 52% of time is devoted to direct class instruction, teacher standing in front of the board or working with students. They would prefer about 61% of that to be uh, successful. Back in the fall, students responded that about 41% of the time was uh, dedicated to whole class uh, direct instruction. Okay, so move the needle on that. Uh, students are still saying they would like, they would like a little bit more. The uh, next question here is asking questions. They, a question about do they feel they're learning math more deeply this year? At the beginning of the school year, we asked them, did they feel they were learning in math? So we've we kind of asked a little bit different question, more deeply learning. And you can see about 38% of our students agree that they're learning math more deeply this year. The, the last graph that I have here related to the student survey is how they took advantage of uh, supports. So these are supports during the school day, before, after school, 
uh, during lunchtime, et cetera. Lots of options for our students. Uh, you can see that there's a gap in the uh, amount of interventions that are offered to support students and how students are taking advantage of them, as illustrated by the, the large amount of reports in that NEVER column. One of our parents asked about the cost of additional interventions that we've done uh, before or after school. And on that slide there talks about that. There was about 100 uh, district paid tutoring sessions uh, that we did. There was about 34 uh, paid district uh, online classes, 22 paid summer school enrollments, and about 90 final exam retakes at last count. And the investment in that was about $41,000. Okay. I've also included two. We asked an open-ended question to our students relative to uh, their experience with CPM. Uh, they provided a lot of responses to that. And uh, Dr. Golitz uh, did take all those responses, read each one, and provided those into themes for us. And uh, we'll just leave it up there for a second or two for you to take a look at. Our students also uh, provided some uh, narrative, other reflections. Uh, I've included a couple examples for you in that, kind of uh, for or, or not for uh, CPM. And again, those are available on the, on the handout that I uh, provided there. So that was the big picture around alignment, adjustments we made, what did the adjustments tell us in terms of that early data, and now let's move on to the, the proposals, or maybe I'll pause there. Dan? No, I just want to point out something on the, on the last slide where it says data analysis dash teacher survey. That should be data analysis dash student survey. Oh. Right, right before. before. Very good. Thank you. Yep. One of my typos it's on, on slide 58. Flags. Apologize for that. That's okay. I just wanted we'll get to that point fixed. it out. Yep. Okay. Uh, so moving on to uh, proposal one. Uh, proposal one simply is, let's return to the old algebra, uh, geometry, algebra two curriculum sequence uh, starting next school year. Uh, algebra one would be in a three trimester format. Uh, geometry, whether it's honors or not, or algebra two honors or not, would be in the two trimester format like it always uh, has been. Try to supplement the math practices experienced in the traditional class work, hard to do. And what we would do is we would let that settle for a year. And then in the 2019-2020 school year, we would start not just a high school full review, but a full K-12 curriculum review for a curriculum. I want to point out uh, some implications to that. Uh, so part of Proposal 1 is, you know, students, we've heard, would, would probably feel more comfortable in, in the familiar lecture-based format in math. We do know, though, it's, it's not aligned very well at all to the content standards or the math practice standards. It's not aligned very well to our uh, district key initiatives we have. And we believe student learning and their resulting achievement would probably be limited as a result of that because it's measured by the state, local, and national assessments that are asking much different levels of understanding of our students than, than we were ever asked. Joe, I have a quick question. When were those standards changed? or Is this new for the district? Is it new for the state? Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the Common Core uh, state standards have been around for uh, a number of years. Uh, maybe uh, Stuart. Yeah, 2009, 2010. So they've been around for, for a number of years. Uh, the state of Michigan has fine-tuned those standards uh, to what we talked about today. And just recently, uh, you know, we've made this change to, to meet those new standards. So with what's being presented today as it relates to the alignment um, of state standards, um, this is, it's not so much the change occurred in 2008, 2009. Are we trying to catch up, or I'm just trying to follow? We're talking about these standards and state standards, but I'm, I'm trying to understand the timing. Are we delayed? Are we behind? Are we ahead of the game, behind the yeah. game? Where, where are we at on that? Yeah, fair question. I think uh, Birmingham, like other school districts, are in a continual process to align, align to the most current standards. I think that our, our timing is, is probably pretty good. Uh, typically, when standards come out, uh, most districts let them uh, settle for a, a few years. They also uh, give staff a time to get acclimated to those standards, and also in terms of getting started on the curriculum alignment process. Uh, alignment process, as I reviewed previously, that's a multi-year process, and that's usually described by our framework we have for curriculum alignment. And it takes a number of years to put all the pieces in place, review curriculum, uh, try out materials and eventually go for a full uh, 
roll out. So I would say we're probably on time relative to what the whole process takes. So our curriculum process is the seven-year process. Yes. 2008-2009 uh, is when Common Core may have adjusted mm -hmm. to say, hey, we need to step it up a little bit. Uh, so now we're in a position where we're stepping it up from a 2008-2009 standard? Relatively. Yeah, the only thing I would additionally add, and please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't want to be, you know, the Common Core developed, you know, a framework across all the curriculum groups, and then each state developed standards. Right. So after right. that was done, it took a number of years for the state of Michigan to say, how are we going to align to those Common Core state standards? And so I don't know which particular year that put Michigan in, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a, a sequential process from the, the national perspective. These are not a government standards at, at all. They're, they've been designed by each of the individual curriculum areas. For, and then each state has to align, so that took a couple of years, a number of years as well. Then each district then looks at its curriculum, and we, we do it on a kind of a, a rotating basis. So when math came in, that was the time to align to the standards when this was brought forward in 2017. That's just kind of how it all sequentially rolls. Right. So is there a point at which the state will say you're aligned or you're not aligned, uh, we're going to take away state aid? Right? Well, is, that, is, that, is that extreme? Your question, and what, yeah. what is the stick the state uses for that? It's the M step. It's the, the standardized assessments. So that's another piece to consider as you're aligning curriculum, whether it's in math or science or other content areas, is when is the state going to hold us accountable for that? And that, again, was one, re one reason why we made the change when we did. Yeah. Good. Joe, when, when was that testing, uh, when was the standardized testing adjusted to the new standard? Yeah. So maybe uh, Michelle or Stuart, in terms of when was the adjustment made relative to uh, the new standards? So just to repeat, uh, so many states are looking at the Smarter Balance Consortium for types of questions. Uh, when we take our MSEP test, uh, you typically don't hear that it's a Smarter Balance assessment, but it's basically on that foundation, and that was around uh, 2015. And what about the other tests? I, I forget which ones we were using. MSEP? Oh, the, the SA, S PSAT? Yes. PSAT, that's a relatively new adjustment to uh, the test. As you recall, I think it was just a year ago that the the National uh, SAT College Board actually changed the SAT and revamped it, the scoring and everything, and types of questions uh, to meet the new college readiness movement. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, proposal two, uh, that proposal has to do with the original CPM approach uh, with, the, uh, with the original instructional approach, too, that relies heavily on collaborative teams, uh, Lectures, whole class discussions when appropriate, checking for understandings, justifying students' thinking, as well as uh, lesson closure to ensure students' understanding of big mathematical ideas. All those are all the tenets of CPM that, uh, in fact, are happening every day in our, in our classroom. The question is, is the tweak on the instructional approach. So the implications, if you went back to a pure CPM, with a pure, as written by CPM, instructional approach, these are some implications. Yes, strong alignment with the content, strong alignment with the mathematical practices, uh, strong alignment with our key initiatives, strong alignment in terms of uh, with all the uh, achievement and the measures, how our students are measured. However, though, if we went strictly with this proposal too, you know, students may continue to feel the need for additional teacher direct instruction to, to gain mastery with math concepts. They also may continue to feel frustrated with just the whole social dynamics of learning in math groups during the majority of a class time. And uh, students may continue, many students may continue to feel frustrated with the group grades calculated in with their uh, term grades. And that's what we heard in our uh, surveys we did of students, you know, in the midway through the year and, and at the end of the year. Before I go on to uh, proposal three, I want to point out a student survey question number 10. And that was, we asked of students, think about how you learn in class and what you do in class. Indicate how you feel about each of these activities. So we asked our students in terms of what would they, 
how do they respond to certain types of activities in class? And we kept those in mind as we looked at proposal three. Essentially, they're giving us a roadmap for their comfort level with different types of activities in terms of helping them, helping them learn. So proposal three is to continue with the college preparatory math program, integrated math resource with a BPS modified instructional approach. And I know that early on at one of the forums, correct, CPM is written for a you know, full on collaborative approach. However, you know what, our teachers know they've been in this business a long time. And we know when we do curriculum reviews that a textbook and a program is simply, is simply a book. How our teachers take that resource, what they do with that resource in classrooms, how they scaffold that for our students, how they modify it for the high learners and the students that struggle and everyone in between, that is the, that is the craft of teaching. And what our teachers are saying is that, that we can put a BPS spin on this. We can do, we can do modifications based on what our students are, and our parents are telling us that will help them be successful. And what you heard from Scott and Ann and Kelly is those, those changes that they've made, they're seeing those specific uh, adjustments in class and uh, results in class. So just pointing out proposal three is continuing some of those interventions, adjustments we made midway through the year. Having honors courses for CPM uh, two and three, having math lab support options for all trimesters. Something new that you may not have seen is having an enrichment extension class for third trimester for CPM two and three. Also too, making those instructional adjustments in, in our classrooms and also in pacing. The idea of group grades uh, not calculated in the individual term grades of students. And then having increasing student access to the supports, having unit tests, relearn and retake options. And you know what, we really want to enhance our community parent BPS partnerships. We know that if we work together for the benefit of our kids around CPM, that we can help all our students achieve. Those that are at the top end of the spectrum, those students that struggle and everyone in between, we need to put our energies together to help this program be successful for every single one of our students. And then finally, there was some uh, questions from some parents relative to if they're participating in online courses with algebra right now, might there be an opportunity for them to take uh, an algebra option, not next year, but the following year, and that's, uh, that's in discussion now too. So this has implications for proposal three. Yes, strong alignment to content, to mathematical practices, to uh, key district initiatives, and we believe achievement and uh, learning will increase with this modified set of instructional approaches. Uh, also two implications is, you know, many students will feel more comfortable with a balanced approach to teacher instruction and group learning in terms of gaining mastery. Also two students will feel more comfortable having group grades not be part of their final grade for the class and represent their individual work. And you know what, we believe that Many students will, many if not all, will have a greater advantage in skills and learning as a result of students that aren't engaged in, uh, in CPM. And as Dan mentioned, that's, that is our recommendation is, is proposal three. And just to uh, wrap up here, just with a few more slides, uh, be patient with me. Uh, this is a, a recopy of a slide I showed you earlier, the adjustments that we made during uh, this second half of the school year. Everything coded in green are items that we're carrying forward into this new proposal three. What you see in red are items that will be phased out after the school year because we'll have a fresh start, beginning of the school year. We don't believe we're going to need uh, final exam replacements, zero or six hours, uh, summer school, online options, or district paid tutors. We believe that if we start fresh in the school year with this modified approach, we engage our community around supporting our students and really work together on that, that our students are going to be uh, successful. The last piece of proposal three has to do with continue to work with teachers. Our teachers have been working very hard, been getting uh, professional learning since last spring, getting re and even before then, uh, getting ready for the implementation. We're gonna continue working with our teachers during the summer, during next school year, as well as bringing on additional teachers to CPM. And priority areas for next school year are going to include working with small groups, teacher instructional roles, questioning strategies, and then really getting at uh, assessments for learning to make sure we know how students are doing. One of my last slides here are, are the budget proposal. We heard one of our parents reference the difference in cost. Uh, yes, there is a difference in cost. Uh, 
Algebra 1 textbooks, uh, we have to go out and find used textbooks. Uh, those are 10-year-old textbooks. Uh, there are some used ones on the market we could uh, pick up. Additional support, our teachers would return to what they were doing before uh, CPM. Proposal 2 and 3 have identical costs with those. Uh, that's moving forward on the CPM 2 materials, CPM 3 as well as the manipulatives that go along with that. And then there's also additional costs for teacher uh, training and then additional student supports in there. Uh, to a total of about $157,000. So just in closing, uh, thank you for being patient with me. It's a 45-minute presentation. You had some good questions for me. You know, as you've heard from our teachers, 100% of them support that. I stand behind our teachers in terms of supporting uh, CPM2 as a former uh, engineer, former math teacher, former science teacher, physics teacher. Uh, we do believe that this is going to be uh, an advantage for our students not only for their uh, immediate learning, for, but for learning to come. And with that, I'll take any of your final questions or comments. All right, on board, any just, questions? Just Joe, uh, I would like to see the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I think it said here, increased direct instruction up to 70%. I think you said from 50 to 70%. Yeah, there was a I'd, like to, I'd like to see it start at 70%. Okay. You know, I would like to be a little bit more than 50%. I just, that's just my opinion. Okay. okay. I think, I think uh, with our teacher, I, point well taken. I think with our teachers, depending on the day and uh, depending on what's happening in class, some days are more instruction, direct instruction than that. Some days are less instruction. Uh, our teachers are great at adapting what students need and, and, what, and, what, they, uh, and you know, what they need to be, be successful, achieve, depending on the concept, how difficult it is, what they're doing. But point well taken. You'd like to see it yeah, at, a, at a higher rate. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Any other board comments, questions? President and I will, um, I, I will allow an answer to that, but that will, unfortunately, because of how we're structured, we want to make sure that we're adhering to the agenda. Um, Michelle, I will go ahead and allow you guys to respond to that, but we'll have to move on to the next okay. phase of that. Yeah. Repeat the question, if you would, because yes. that doesn't get picked up on the microphone, yeah. so it's hard to hear that at home. Sure. The question, uh, I believe the first part of the question was, how will our CPM reps be able to <coughs> assist us when we are shifting to uh, a different model of direct instruction, uh, more direct instruction. And then the second part will be, uh, will we make available to parents the resources to support students and know what's going on in the, in the instructional piece? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so our CPM reps have been very, very supportive all the way through this process. Uh, we have a CPM implementation coach that has been part of this process, and then also our teacher facilitator trainer that's been part of this process. Both have worked very closely with us uh, from the beginning of the school year through our shifts in instruction uh, into the third trimester and third quarter, and they are working with us to try and fine tune that instruction to work for uh, a model that has a little bit more direct instruction um, and teacher-led uh, instruction. Um, there's not like a one-size-fits-all instructional model of CPM, so they are very good with us and trying to adapt uh, to best fit our needs of our students. And they've worked with many, many school districts in the past, so they've seen lots of different implementation styles, so they're ready and willing to help us with that, uh, that shift as we do, customize it in, in our district. And in terms of the, uh, the parent supports and giving some information, uh, you'll notice on one of those earlier slides uh, right here, oops, sorry, uh, that there's some student supports built into that. Um, just as students received the uh, parent guides this year for CPM1, 
they would receive those same uh, documents next year for um, integrated math one and integrated math two. And those uh, parent guides, they give a summary of each section in a very traditional way. Uh, they give some example problems, which we heard from our student survey students would like to see more examples. And then it gives um, some sample problems, uh, some practice problems with um, uh, solutions as well. So yes, we would make that available for you next year as part of our uh, plan. Mm -hmm. thank you. Michelle uh, and Joe, thank you so much. Um, board, any other questions? Yeah, I, I have one. Joe, during the process of evaluation that we've been through over the past few months, um, obviously you looked at a lot of data. You looked at not only the research that we did internally, but external. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, did you come across and did you review any research that came to opposing conclusions in the terms of the value and the productivity of CPM? Yeah, most of the, most of the research that I, uh, that I reviewed and saw talked about uh, some challenges related to the implementation of, of integrated math. Uh, there's not a lot of specific scientific research out on CPM itself. There's some CPM research that's sponsored by CPM. Of course, you always got to be suspect of that. But it was really independent research uh, that I looked at relative to integrated math programs and the specific data I looked at relative to the, the California schools. But the other research that we looked at relative to uh, challenges with implementation, uh, there were some points uh, with that that talked about uh, the shift of students from coming from a traditional program to a, you know, to an integrated program, and what, what pieces to look out for with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, one of the things that uh, the, the board has been working diligently with the administration and the leadership team and just trying to find ways so that we can actually answer some of the questions. Um, obviously, this was a lengthy uh, presentation, lots of data, lots of information that I'm sure um, many members of our community would like to process. Uh, we are in the process of developing a, a Q&A type fact sheet. So if there are additional questions, um, you know, again, there will be some communications that will be coming out over uh, the next couple of days and the next couple of weeks um, to help address and or answer some of those questions. Uh, Joe, anything thank else to add to that? No, just thank you for allowing us the time to share the, the big picture around CPM. Thank you so much. You. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to the final report, and that is our bond update. Uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and transfer over to Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a month where we want to briefly present an update on the bond, and I'll turn it over to Andy Fountain. Thank you. Do that from, uh, Thank you. Uh, Plan Moran Cressa. Go ahead, please. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Good evening. I um, have an update here for you um, regarding the uh, uh, 2015 bond issue program. Um, we're going to look um, at uh, the dashboard update that's been uploaded to the website. We'll look at uh, some of the construction um, items that are coming up uh, for 2018, and then we'll look at some, uh, some of the progress that's already been made for 2018. Um, so uh, again, your, your uh, dashboard report, um, uh, some of the items here, uh, you know, uh, the board resolved to uh, I go out for a millage, uh, actually it was a no millage increase, but for a bond in 2015, it's 66 million. Um, it's a 20 year millage. Um, some of the short term tasks here, we have uh, the West Maple Pool renovation that's ongoing. We're getting ready to um, kick off the um, Meadow Lake uh, abatement project. We have partial roofing replacement as well as a, a parking lot project that's coming up along with various technology items. Um, surveillance, um, some uh, visual display boards that are going to be um, wrapping up this summer. So there's some of the, uh, the projects that we're working on um, and into the summer. Um, the next slide is uh, just reconciliation of your budget and cash flows. Um, the, uh, you can see that the current uh, budget is still at the 65 million. Um, and then um, over on the right hand side you can see the current commitments along with uh, actuals paid. And then below you can see your uh, reconcili reconciliation of cash flows for both series one and series two. Um, moving on to the uh, next slide here. This is just a, a preview of some of the projects that we have um, um, 
coming up for uh, the summer of 2018. So we're going to be, we've already started uh, the uh, Sea Home Performing Arts Center renovation. Um, we also have some renovations to the Sea Home Pool sound system. Um, we have a rooftop unit replacement at West Maple. We have a partial roof replacement at Sea Home High School, as well as um, phase two of the community ed parking lot at Sea Home High School. Um, some of the uh, technology projects going on this summer are uh, relate to uh, video surveillance updates um, and also some network and wireless system updates. Um, next slide here, uh, this just kind of lets you know what, what's already taken place. So uh, as I stated, we, we've already started the renovation at, uh, at Sea Home Performing Arts Center, so most of those items uh, relate to that, to that work. Um, we also have some uh, bathroom flooring replacement that's going to happen at Beverly, Beverly Elementary. Um, along with the uh, West Maple rooftop unit replacement that's scheduled for uh, roughly July 12th, to be exact, uh, for, uh, for that project. I also have some, uh, some uh, items, I think you, you've seen this before, this just illustrates the um, phase two um, parking lot replacement um, at Sea Home. The uh, shaded or the uh, out, outlined area in red uh, illustrates uh, what that phase two project will look like, the portion of the parking lot that's going to be replaced. Um, I also have a similar uh, map here that shows the areas of the roof, uh, approximately 88,000 square feet, one-third of the roof for um, Seahome High School that will be uh, kicking off here shortly in a few weeks once, uh, once school is uh, concluded for the year. Um, also uh, another map showing the um, renovation that's go uh, areas that are being renovated as part of the uh, Performing Arts Center at Seahome High School. And then we have some, uh, some construction progress photos provided to us from uh, Clark Construction. So this is one of the stage calipers um, that's, uh, that's been constructed or working towards completion at the at Sea Home Performing Arts. We have the uh, demolition of the uh, existing boiler room. Um, we have some of the new equipment uh, starter boxes and master controls for the, uh, the lighting, electrical, uh, related to the Performing Arts Center. Um, this is the existing uh, stage area, uh, fresh paint um, on the ceiling and walls. And then this is a progress photo of your uh, expansion for the scene shop. Um, so this is uh, your northwest elevation, and then we have another one from your um, southeast, or looking at the southeast elevation. And then we also have some, uh, another photo of the inside of the scene shop addition. And that concludes my update. <laughs> Board, any questions. questions at all? Yeah, just one. Um, how long is the Sea Home roof, uh, how long does it last? Uh, you have a warranty for 20 years. 20 years? Um, with, uh, with proper maintenance, uh, you could easily ex exceed the 20 years. Okay. But you, you have a 20-year warranty with that roofing system. Thank you. Yep. Board, any other questions at all regarding the bond update? Nope. nope. All right, we will Thank move you. on to our resolutions section. Um, the first item there is our personnel actions. And uh, Dan, are there any comments you'd like to share regarding this resolution? Just very briefly, the, the items are standard, but I do want to point out a very significant recommendation rather relative to the retirement of Nydia Foley. And what's significant about that recommendation is she has 50 years oh, and nine I months in this school district. What a remarkable 50 point tenure. something. And then I would also point out, going to another age uh, uh, cohort, that Omar Hakim is on the uh, uh, report tonight as well. 50.9 yeah, It's months. remarkable. I saw her last Friday. I think it was Friday she was... I mean, wow. it's, it's just a remarkable career and person that's really given of herself and has lots God of energy. Unbelievable. All right, Ford, uh, is there a motion for Resolution 72 regarding personnel actions? It's been moved. Second. And seconded by Trustee Edge Looney. Uh, all those in favor of Motion 72, please state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, we will move on now to Resolution 73, which is the Lisa Co. Paraprofessional of the Year Award. 
uh, we have heard great words and very kind words about uh, our paraprofessionals, the work that they've done, and uh, we sincerely appreciate all the hard work that uh, you guys have done for us. Uh, we, can, we are very appreciative, and I hear conversations all the time from teachers and the support that paraprofessionals play uh, in our district, and uh, I think from this end, we sometimes don't realize what that support is, and I have a better understanding of that from um, hearing all the stories of the hard work that you've done. Uh, so, Dan, are there any comments you'd like to no, share regarding I, this resolution? I, I paraphrased a lot of the uh, resolution in my comments about both uh, the paraprofessional as well as the teacher of the year. Okay, great. Board, any comments, questions? All right. Um, is there a motion for resolution 73, recognizing our paraprofessional of the year? So moved. It's been moved. Second. And seconded. And all those in favor? Please state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing none, uh, the motion passes. Uh, we will now move on to resolution number 74. Uh, again, Maureen uh, has just been a, a staple. I've gotten to know her quite well. Uh, she's been very vocal. I don't know how Scott's going to live without her. <laughs> uh, but Maureen, <laughs> Maureen, we are so appreciative of all the work that you've done and your voice. Uh, your commitment and desire to the district, uh, even the, the courage that you have to share uh, your perspective uh, when it's needed most. Uh, so we are truly going to miss your voice. Uh, and we appreciate all that you've done and we wish you the best uh, moving forward. Uh, any, uh, Dan, any comments at all? No, Anything other else to add? to extend my thanks to Maureen as well. Uh, board, any statements, uh, comments? All right. It's my pleasure to make the motion. Motion All right. 74 in honor of Maureen Martin. Awesome. Is there a second to that? Second. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of motion 74, please state by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion. Uh, we're going to move on to now um, resolution 75, which is the integrated math. Um, and the, again, as Dan has stated, the next resolution is to approve the instructional materials for the CPM integrated math. Um, as stated in January 2017, the board actually approved the curriculum and later rescinded the approval of those materials uh, due to some of the questions and or concerns that have been raised here today. Um, since that time, the Board of Trustees have met with families of children um, in impacted by this curriculum. Um, we've all sat in classrooms to observe the instruction to better understand uh, what we were hearing from our parents and from our teachers. Um, we also met with district leadership teams to listen to the various options uh, that were available. Um, we've requested additional data from our leadership team to better understand student data and outcomes. Um, and we've worked diligently with the leadership team to address some of the needs and concerns that have been expressed even here tonight, uh, which have led to some of the adjustments that we have seen. So um, there's been a lot of work and due diligence behind this. Um, Dan, is there any, uh, any other comments you'd like to share regarding Resolution 74? If I could. Um, I just want to point out some things that are uh, critically important as you consider this resolution. And I think, um, you know, the, the presentations tonight by our parents as well as by our staff illustrate, and I think as Ann Wynn said, this, this is hard. hard. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is a hard uh, change to make. The question is, is it the right change to make? And what we particularly wanted to, uh, um, I guess, focus our attention on is the issue of alignment um, in terms of ensuring whatever curriculum comes forward that we see its, its alignment to the, the current standards. And that's why this curriculum was in fact brought forward uh, right, right from the start. I don't think anyone could have anticipated uh, uh, the level of, of um, concerns that were raised. My own feeling is that um, uh, there was a strong attempt to try to respond to those, those concerns. Um, and I, I think, you know, while we can't say any of the, the, the data is conclusive, I think it does point that there, you know, with the, the modifications in the instructional approach and the modifications in the, the creating interventions, that this curriculum does hold hope um, in terms of 
uh, ensuring that kids are learning consistent with those standards. We know how our teachers feel about this curriculum, and and you know this has been a struggle for them as well. I mean, uh, these these this is it's my word. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but for them to continue to say this is a curriculum that's important to be implemented in this district, tied to student learning. I think is an important consideration. And I know their level of commitment to continue to learn and develop their own, continue to develop and grow as professionals, um, that I, you know, I, I, I take that at face value, and we've seen that throughout the year. Obviously, uh, we know that our, our students continue to have concerns uh, and, and feel a level of dissatisfaction. But I also see in, within our data that the level of discomfort is decreasing. The question is, over time, Will the right kind of support continue to uh, lessen that discomfort? And so we present this recommendation to you with a different, another set of recommendations that go with it. Math labs at the high school level, we're make, we, we'd be making a commitment to implementing those. Those are during the day types of support for students. Offering um, a, a third semester, a trimester for students that are interested uh, in extending their learning and then offering um, these labs for students that need more support for a third trimester. And so we realize that some kids are going to need more time, but that's how, is how it should be for every level of the curriculum that we bring forward. So if the next curriculum comes before you with a higher level of uh, standards, stand, you know, and let me make a point there, is the standards that are currently in place were changed to make them more rigorous across the board. And so with that, there is going to be a level of, of frustration with learning. Now, we want to keep that within manageable limits, of course. And so I just want to, as you think about these things, keep that in mind about the alignment to the standards, that this is a modified approach, that you know, we're, we're, we're saying CPM, but these things have to be in place that are different than the pure CPM uh, 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 model. And then I would also say my greatest hope is going forward, should this be supported, and it's really going to be now left in the board's hands, and we'll answer any questions that you have. There will be a need for ongoing flexibility as this is being implemented. You know, there was flexibility along the way. Let's keep our minds open to what are uh, additional things that could be done uh, to ensure that the satisfaction with kids go, go down, learning continues to advance to, to the standards. And then I did, and I, I think Jessica pointed it out relative to the resolution. The reason it's framed this way is that there was a uh, resolution to discontinue the resources for levels two and three, but not to discontinue the curriculum. The curriculum was in, approved in January 2017. So uh, if this is not supported, then it would have to be a recommendation in my mind to discontinue this curriculum. That's why we didn't frame the resolution that way we can help you if, if, if that uh, is needed. And so I would just offer those perspectives as you uh, deliberate on this now. All right, I'll have an app, uh, provide each board member an opportunity to make a statement if they choose, um, and then we will do a roll call vote uh, so that uh, we can vote and allow that opportunity for you to share. So so anyone can start? Well, oh, you want, oh, oh I yes, know. I'm sorry. Well, I do have to take the motion. So is there a motion for resolution 75, which is the integrated math? So move. Need a motion on the table to have discussion. Sorry. So the motion should come Sorry. first. So second. All right. It's been moved and second, uh, and uh, I will allow the opportunity for board comment. Oh. Um, first, I just wanted to um, thank all the people who've come to our meetings. Um, really, it's, it's been an amazing amount of momentum since January, and. Um, the public comment has been extraordinary. But I also want to thank people who um, couldn't make it but expressed their opinions to us by email. That includes members of our staff and also parents in the community. Um, I want to thank the district. Um, as Jessica pointed out in her introductory remarks to this motion, there was an immense amount of data collection. And to me, it felt like um, it was a drop everything and get solutions on the table type thing. But we didn't drop everything. Um, as, as was pointed out, mean, while all this is going on, there's new foreign language courses being developed. There's graduation ceremonies happening. It, even though it felt like $41,000 of 
stuff brought to the table to help parents and students, it wasn't drop everything and just do this. It was do this and do everything else too. And to that, I owe my thanks to the district. And I also want to thank my colleagues. I'm uniquely situated in that I, I don't and I haven't had kids in the district. I myself was not a student in Birmingham Public Schools. And with that um, comes a bit of a disconnect with some parent members in the community. I, I do try to connect and build those relationships, but because I am new to the community, I don't have them right away. And my colleagues have done a great job of letting me know what they've heard from members of the community, whether it be neighbors they've known for 10 years, um, or teachers they taught with, or um, just parents they're friends with. And to that, I owe a great deal of gratitude. But what I found probably most helpful um, was to observe the class for myself and to that I owe thanks to Ms. Leland and her students um, who let a person they didn't know come into their classroom with a three-month-old strapped to them and, um, and didn't bat an eye when little Thaddeus slept through her whole class. So um, I, I owe a great deal of thanks to Ms. Leland and her students. I also want to acknowledge a comment I heard today um, from Mike Numer. He brought up um, what's a huge... Um, task that we face as a board, a huge concern, which is um, the massive deficit. And that does reflect a, financial, a massive financial change for our district. Um, but this is not an area where I feel it in the best interest of students to cut costs. Um, and that um, concludes my statements until the roll call vote. Trustees, any other? Uh, yes, I, I'd like to say something. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, we'll go so we're going around. I apologize. No, I would just like to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate your comments from the parents. Uh, I'm knee deep in it too, um, with my daughters, and uh, I feel your frustration. Um, um, I think this goes a long way to, to uh, help. I, I, I said before, I, I believe that we should have a little bit more teacher instruction. I would like to see it at 70 percent. Uh, I, I have talked to many, many people and. Uh, one of the biggest complaints was was the amount of teacher participation. So I hope that goes up. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but uh, and I appreciate all of you coming out and, and, and expressing your views. And I want to thank the board too. Thank you. So again, I just want to thank you to all of the parents and community members who have reached out to us, and um, and for those of you that have spent countless hours with me, going through coffees and presentations and things like that. I just want the community to know that this entire group has spent countless hours, whether again it's being in the classroom, watching the teachers teach, speaking with the students, going through the data, sitting with the administration. We have not taken this whole thing lightly. As parents that are going through, our children are going through this, we understand all the frustrations. And I think Joe said it best when you said that the CPM, it's books. What we're, what we're entrusting is that the teaching and learning is going to take place, and I have full, full, full confidence of our teaching staff that they will be able to do this. The one thing I will pro encourage and hope that we can keep going is the dialogue. We'll go through next year. Let's just keep the lines of communication going and keep everything where we're understanding um, and it's all transparent. And the last thing I will say is I, too, am a CPA, and my child will be going through this next year. And from a dollar's perspective, I, I, would, I would be really hard-pressed to go back and to piggyback what you've said and go through and just cut the costs for sake of cutting costs. Thank you. Um, one of the things I was thinking about in Joe's presentation, and he, uh, it, when I look at the, the vision for the mathematics department, one of the things that stood out was all students. And as I have gone through this process, I've actually evolved in my thinking. Um, initially, I looked at CPM and I'm like, okay, I get it, I understand it, I see this is something that can benefit children. It kind of, uh, it definitely emulates what we see in corporate. Um, and I love the opportunity and the rigor, uh, the opportunity of rigor um, in the area of math. And, but one of the things that stands out the most is all students. And as I processed today, and again, my thoughts have evolved, but listening and hearing that uh, we have still 60 to 65 percent of data for a group of students. Uh, that we weren't able to 
truly understand or to get some metrics on, uh, it's kind of alarming for me. It's, it's, I'm, I'm struggling with that. And um, data, I'm a data girl. I, I come from that background as well. And, and data to me is important. And um, I believe in everything that has been done. I was actually, initially, I was, when I look at the history and how my experience on being on the board, I, I've always considered everything a slow moving train. Uh, and I, the work uh, and the commitment of our teachers, our leadership, our administration in the past six months, I, I am still floored. I, I didn't think it, it was actually possible to make the uh, amount of change and transition that has occurred. Um, and, and what that transition or the, what I've witnessed from our teachers, what I've witnessed from um, our administrators and leadership team, it gives me some hope that uh, we are nimble enough to, to move forward. But uh, all that being said, uh, you know, processing where we're at, where we need to go, and to make sure that all students are impacted, um, I think that we have an area of opportunity as a district. Um, but I, I appreciate all of the work uh, that has been done from everyone in this room. And uh, I want to continue that dialogue because it does not stop here. Um, I recall having a conversation with a parent, and I know that the advanced students, children that are performing well, they have been represented well. I look in that room, I, I look uh, across and I see families. These are parents of children that are doing really well or fairly well. They're performing, they're, they're seeing the change. What I have not seen, and, and it's a frustration of mine, uh, until I uh, listened to, uh, I can't remember the parents, uh, Trisha. Yeah, Trisha. Uh, that was the probably first or second time that I've actually heard from a parent of a child that was not advanced, a child that was not performing um, and not responding uh, with the, the results that, that we've seen represented here today, uh, which is still um, you know, concerning. But I, I, I'm grateful for all the work. I've learned a lot in this process. I learned a lot about our district in this time. I see there's areas of opportunity and ways that we can probably write a book on after this. Um, but uh, very pleased with the work that we've done. And uh, I appreciate, again, all the comments and everything that's been provided to date. I'm an engineer, MBA by education. Uh, one of the parents asked us at the town hall, do you really understand yet what the root problem is? Because you can't solve the problem if you don't really understand what went wrong. And, and it's, it's, it wasn't clear in February if we understood fully the depth of it, right? But we, we went through this collaborative process with student voice and, and teachers and whatnot. And it seems to me uh, that what we thought then is true even tonight, that there was a, there was a problem with the implementation uh, of CPM. Uh, that's my view, right? It, it's not inherent in integrated math. It was around implementing, one, a much more rigorous course, and two, putting a lot of instructional changes mm -hmm. on these kids' plates. And you put those two things together, given the level of support that we afforded our teachers, which was consistent with prior rollouts, but I think not adequate for this particular rollout. You put all that together, and, and we, we failed. But again, I don't think it's a failure uh, around integrated math. Uh, more than once, I tried to walk away from this decision, because I've learned in my uh, personal life and my business life, when you, when you make a big decision and you make a mistake, it's easy emotionally, financially, organizationally to get wrapped around justifying that decision. Dr. Nair will remember some heart-to-hearts we had back in February, right? I was trying to walk away from it, right? Uh, but I couldn't. I kept coming back to this notion that the world's changed, uh, not just the standards in a, in a narrow sense, right, which they have, uh, but I think the demands are higher. And I look back at my education, right, as an engineer, math didn't help me, and I, I went through the calculus sequence, I took differential equations. I liked it so much I took it more than once, actually. <laughs> uh, but I didn't learn anything about working with others and, and, and the communication challenges that were described earlier from my math classes. I had to take other courses to benefit. And I think what we've got here, again, while it's more rigorous and more difficult, it's, it's a higher order requirement, which I think is consistent with what we want to 
provide our kids and consistent with what I think employers want. So I, I, I'm going to vote yes uh, tonight because I think this is the right thing to do for our kids. Uh, there is no door number two on the table tonight. That's not an option, right? That would take a lot of time and energy. Joe's allowed for that process to unfold in the 19... 20 school year. My view is, in the interim, if you think that's still an option, or if you still think that's a requirement, given this data that we all want, right? We all want more data. Although, in Dr. Deerad's defense, he said it was going to take till summer to get that data, and we moved them forward to the beginning of June, right? And we don't have all the data. But uh, my view is, uh, if, if, if we do want to look at that process and restart that, we're better off continuing with CPM in the interim. And my gut says uh, it's going to get better. It's already getting better. It's going to continue to get better. Uh, I don't say that based on the data, because there isn't enough, although that NWEA data for the eighth graders is off the charts good. It's hard to imagine right, that, that won't, we won't see some kind of continuation of that. Uh, where I probably differ from some in our community uh, tonight is I, I, have, uh, I continue to have faith and trust in our curriculum leaders and in our instructional leaders and in our professionals in the classroom and uh, for me that's enough I think uh, I don't need a research study uh, I'd like more data in time to confirm that this is the right thing to do but I have faith in those people they're doing good things and I think there's evidence that it's uh, improving the one thing I'm not happy with uh, tonight is that this really shines a light on that bottom decile which I think is your point Jessica right there's kids that are struggling right we're not meeting their needs that's not unique to CPM, right? Uh, you could say that about many of our curriculum areas. That's a challenge that we have, right? We've got that mm -hmm. fancy distribution chart, mm -hmm. and, and on one day we're focused here, and we had a presentation on honors, and the next day we're focused right here, and then, but, but we're not meeting the needs of those kids. And there's some things here that I like. I think the math labs is a terrific idea, right? Because the part my view is the participation in some of the offerings that we provided kids, uh, w w it was, it was not satisfactory. It was not a great response, right? But we, we, we forced it on them before and after school, and, and right, we, we made it really tough for them to participate. So I, I hope that's an indicator of more that we can do, because that's not, to me, unique to CBM. That's something we need to do a better job of. But that's not, in my view, a reason to hold this up. That 10% is something we're struggling with in a lot of different areas. So again, I, I would vote yes. OK, my turn. For those of you that don't know, I have been a teacher in Birmingham for 30.75 years. <laughs> I have spent my entire career here in Birmingham, and I have seen many programs come, and I've seen them go. I've seen trends come. I've seen trends go. I have been on committee after committee um, trying to decide what is best for children and what I think I believe in most is that there have been thoughtful processes that have evolved, that have been put in place to choose these curriculums. They're not just, you know, we didn't um, choose them easily. There is so much research behind these decisions. There's so much information collected. And then we go, when we find one or two that look really good and we've read and researched and so forth, we pilot them and we try these programs out. Now, when it comes time to make a decision, these are not easy decisions, and this was not something that was um, without its background and research. So when this was presented back in January of 2017, and I heard the presentation, and I thought, wow, this is good stuff. And I made my decision, and I voted for it. And I was not prepared for the response. And I had to step back. And I went, oh my gosh, what have I just done? What have I done? And I didn't know if maybe I didn't think or, or uh, read enough. Maybe I didn't hear enough information about it, and I couldn't make a good decision. And I became very nervous. I mean. These are my neighbors, these are my friends, these are my um, people that I, I live with, giving me this feedback that I just wasn't prepared for. So I had to stop. And what every good decision maker does is they try to gather more information so you can make the best decision. And so I started talking to people 
my friends and my neighbors and the people that I live with. And then I started talking with my former colleagues, friends. And then I was invited into the classroom. And I went to four classrooms. And I think I spoke with perhaps 90 kids. Because remember, this is all about the kids. This is not about us. This is not about me. This is about, well, it's about my children. I have two more kids coming up. But it, it's about the kids. And what I heard from these kids convinced me. They made comments that ranged from, Miss Ash, this was so hard at first. This was so complicated. You know, I, I didn't feel comfortable with this. I couldn't express myself. I, I knew that my grade was just going to drop. I, to, okay, it was hard at the beginning, but I think I'm getting the hang of it. I think I understand. I think I feel more comfortable in a group setting. I feel um, as if I'm really using skills that I haven't before, or that I taught, learned for the test, and the minute the test was over, they were out of my head. The nature of this program is when everything is cyclical or, or comes back, that the kids said, I, I used skills that I learned last year, or last week, or four years ago, that, that connect whatever problem they're working on that CMP offers. And that, to me, was so valuable in making my decision that the kids final, you know, said to me, I, I gathered enough information from these students that I feel this is the right program for our kids, for my children. And I, I did a, a 360. I stopped at the 180. Believe me, I did. And then I came back, just as you mentioned, because I went into the classrooms because I spoke with the kids. And that was enough information for me to vote for option three. Okay, so um, a lot of people have thanked a lot of groups of people for the hard work that went into this and, and continues to be done around uh, integrated math. I think that it's not necessary for me to go through and thank everyone again. There's a lot of passion and obviously a lot of hard work going into uh, the original proposal and then the work that has been done and presented here tonight with the um, options put on the table. Um, it's been said that this is difficult. It's a difficult change. I don't think there's anyone that would dispute that. Um, the question on the table is, is it the right d curriculum? Is it the right decision to move forward with it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I just don't have enough understanding and information and a crystal ball to the future to know if uh, CPM is, is, the, is the right decision at this time. Um, my biggest concern is that in our execution um, and when we made the decision to move to the new curriculum, um, we clearly didn't communicate it well enough. We didn't vet the potential options in terms of the execution and delivery. And I have some concern that what we are doing is in some way bastardizing what the original recommendation was and that in that bastardization of the program will somehow be um, tiptoeing around what is a major difficult change. Um, I did not hear tonight that we have really convinced um, a significant and vocal part of the community that um, the work that's been done, the assessment, the research, if we can call it that, the available data has convinced a lot of those that um, feel like it's not the right decision. Um, and it, for me, it comes down to timing and execution. Um, I agree with Steve's point that as we move forward, 
Um, and we uh, alter, adjust, learn more, gain more data. We can um, adjust the program in terms of its delivery and execution. Some of those things have already been done. Um, but for the reason that it feels um, uh, a little bit rushed, a little bit halfway in terms of timing, um, I will uh, vote against this resolution tonight on a timing basis and because I don't feel that the community has been presented with compelling enough information uh, to change their voice at this point. And it's not just what I've heard tonight, but what I've heard um, as I've spoken with people in the, in the community. Thank you, Walter. Mm -hmm. um, Fran, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Can I just say one more thing? Yes. Or no? No. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to say something that a parent said to me, and she wasn't able to come to the meeting, um, with respect to everything we did to provide supports for students. Um, there's parents who aren't able to come to school board meetings who have students who need support in other areas and they haven't seen that kind of response from the district. They haven't seen district paid tutors. They haven't seen um, uh, different solutions for that and um, frankly they were hurt by this process. And I want to acknowledge um, those parents and just hold, recognize that this board knows um, the standard we've set by presenting that box of, um, you know, band-aids or whatever people want to call it, that box of band-aids, that box of solutions, that box of aids um, to help and, and what that might feel like to somebody who's come to the district with a problem of their own and wasn't presented with a similar toolbox and what that might mean for future issues that arise in this district, particularly given um, the financial issues we, we face too. So I just want to acknowledge um, that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, I would, I, I want to just quickly, I was processing what um, Walter just said. And, um, you know, I think that's where I'm struggling. I, I feel that we have rushed. Um, are we on the right path? Absolutely. Um, I think that we are on the path and we have the potential of making this the program that will work for all students. Do I believe in the program? Yes. Do I believe in the teachers? Yes. Do I believe in uh, the, the uh, remediation that's put in place? I don't know yet. Um, so uh, the more time that I would have to, to analyze that would be, um, you know, advantageous because we are talking about, like I said, 60 percent of a, a population. So my vote would be no as well, but uh, I wanted to make sure that I was clear in, in stating that as well. So Fran, we can go ahead and go with the roll call. So just point of clarification, We're not. President Thomas. So a yes vote or an I vote is for mm -hmm. Resolution 75, which is in essence for Proposal 3 that we all saw earlier in the public Correct. presentation. Mm -hmm. And a no vote is not for 3. It's not clear what else that might be, but it's not not for Proposal 3. Absolutely. Right. Fran? Yes. Nay. Nay. Yes. Nay. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, we are going to move on now to Resolution 76. Um, we all understand in light of all that has occurred across our nation um, and also our district regarding school threats is a priority for our district to ensure the safety of all of our students. And the following resolution is a step forward in using this technology to aid in that effort. Um, Dan, is there any comments you'd like to share regarding resolution 76? Other than for the public to know that this was presented um, at the board meeting on May 15th, where we provided the overview of the plan, and you're absolutely correct. This is the next step that we're proposing uh, to ensure our schools can be as safe as, as, as they can be. Um, and I just assure you that in the future, there will be additional conversations about other next steps. Board, is there a motion for resolution 76, Safe Schools Plan? So moved. All right, it's been moved and supported. Uh, and uh, all those, uh, or any questions at all the board that you may have regarding this resolution. All right. Uh, all those in favor of motion 76, please state by saying aye. 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 Any nays? 
Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on, resolution 77, which is a part of our bond project. Dan, any comments that you'd like to share regarding resolution 77? This is our third phase of this work. Um, you know, we, we've been doing it in chunks along the way. This is very similar furniture that was uh, recommended in the other phases. It's just filling out dollars that were remaining that as the schools were continuing to study what they needed. Thank you so much. Board, is there a motion for Resolution 77 regarding the uh, bond bid awards? Support. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, moving on to Resolution 78, Metal Lake Bid Award. Dan, any comments you'd like to share regarding Resolution 78? This is the result of a number of years study regarding the Metal Lake uh, building that hasn't been used um, for the district. It's been used by the French School and the French Institute. Uh, this is um, the opportunity now to, in this resolution, to have the asbestos removed, which would allow the demolition to if approved in the uh, resolution 79. Debbie, is there anything else to add? And this was reviewed through a study session recently. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we reviewed the study session two weeks ago, and so we discussed it with the Board of Ed. Same as always, we went through our formal bid process with both um, motion 70, uh, yeah, resolution 78 and resolution 79. Um, and three bids were opened for this um, abatement of asbestos at Meadow Lake Elementary School. Um, and low bidder is Martin and Associates um, for a total amount of $210,000. This will be funded from the proceeds of the sale of Meadow Lake, which is uh, tentatively scheduled to close in August of 2018. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. Board, is there a motion for Resolution 78 regarding Meadow Lake? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor of Motion 78, please state by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to Resolution 79, and again, that's a, a demolition of what was just shared. Dan, any other comments? D just to have Debbie review the bid and what the dollar amount is. Yep, uh, same um, RFP process. Um, on May 10th, 12 bids were opened for demolition um, of the Meadow Lake Elementary School post asbestos removal. International Construction is presented to you tonight as the lowest qualified bidder. Um, and for a total cost of $137,402.50. Again, this will be funded from the Building and Site Fund from the proceeds from the sale of Meadow Lake School, tentatively scheduled for August. All right, thank you so much for that. Any question, uh, board, is there a motion for Resolution 79? So moved. It's been moved. And seconded. Um, all those in favor of motion 79, please state by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, next, we're moving on to resolution 80, which is vehicle and equipment purchase. Um, Dan, can you go ahead and give an update on that or uh, any yeah. information you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah what, I'm going to turn it over to Debbie. But, the, you know, we, on an ongoing basis, we review the, the current vehicle ages and we have a uh, a need to recommend some replacements just because of age and wear and tear, and Debbie will fill in the details. Thank you. We have two older vehicles, model years 2002 and 2001, respectively, um, that are scheduled um, for replacement um, due to their excessive um, vehicle repair costs at this point and the age and the mileage of the vehicles. Um, we keep an inventory. We notify, you know, we organize those in such an order as to be hopefully uh, fiscally responsible for those um, replacements. Um, we use a bid process through a cooperative building uh, through the state of Michigan. Todd Wetzel Buick GMC um, has prevented, uh, presented the lowest qualified bid, in this case for our 2018 GMC Sierra and a 2019 GMC Savannah cargo van. So as you see, we looked at different model years as well um, to make a recommendation to you for the lowest qualified bid. Um, that's a total price of $54,781.58. This is funded from the Capital Equipment Fund. The Facilities Department has a replacement budget in that fund on an annual basis of about $75,000, and that's what would be funded on those 
um, vehicle replacements. Second of all, we looked at a backhoe. Um, our backhoe is in uh, grave need of repair and replacement also. In this case, we looked at a purchase or a lease option to see what was most economically feasible for the district. And based on cost of current backhoes, we've decided to move forward with a John Deere lease. This lease will be funded from the general fund operations budget, so ongoing, but it's only about $7,500 per year in annual costs. And then we'll evaluate in four years <coughs> after the conclusion of the lease and see if it's more feasible then to buy versus lease. But um, that's been recommended for this evening's um, resolution section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Board, is there a motion for resolution 80? No, no. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor of resolution 80, please state by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Um, next, we're going to move on to our policies. Uh, we've had this, the second reading of our code of conduct um, and a couple of others. Um, Dan, any comments at all that you'd like to share regarding this resolution? Uh, other than to share that this was uh, reviewed in a study session a number of weeks ago, um, brought back to the for the first reading last month and the second reading uh, tonight. There are no changes in the language of those three policies since the first reading. Or is there a motion for a resolution? I'm wondering if I could just speak for a second just to, to clarify something briefly. That the um, code of conduct itself falls under administrative guidelines and the language and the policy itself remains unchanged. So all of the language that's under 5600 was the original language that's existed that we're operating under since 2009 with a small revision in 2017. All right. Or is there a, a yeah, I, I have a question on that. I'm, I'm not sure that I understand that, Rachel. Could you? I can clarify. That was, that was in response to the question from you today. Um, so the, the initial, um, uh, verbiage from 5600 is uh, on some of the questions that you posed those are not changes that I've proposed to the policy that's existing policy and in this policy it refers that the district shall develop administrative guidelines in the code of conduct and that the administrative guidelines will provide greater detail on how this code of conduct is executed Okay, so we had uh, we had a draft of 5,600, correct? With the 56 substantial changes from the prior policy. The 5,600 keeps the the 5,600 keeps all of the preamble where it says the district recognizes in those pieces mm -hmm. in place, and then suggests that administrative guidelines be developed and are not embedded in the policy. So um, I'm, still, I'm still at a loss. Are we voting on policy 5600? Is You're, that what the res resolution? And if so, which language are we talking about? The redlined or the changed? Um, can you point exactly to where you're asking? Because I'm not sure if I have the same copy that you're looking at. Um, I don't have 5600. I have this yeah. code of conduct. Yeah, what's not in the packet I see now is, is what Walter is saying. The policy's not there. The administrative guidelines through the code of conduct are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we should have had here is the, the policy language itself. Right, the, the policy, the, the first read policy, you gave us a red line version of the yep. old policy yep. mm -hmm. and a easy to read, which I appreciated, mm -hmm. uh, revised policy. And I apologize, that should have been included in tonight's okay. packet. And I don't know how we missed that, but yeah. And so it is, it is that policy that this resolution contemplates, correct? It does. And we typically, in past practice of also included administrative guidelines for the board when we're doing such right work. I, un I understand the code of conduct is different but the policy guides mm -hmm. the code of conduct development that's correct, correct. yeah you're correct yes. yeah. okay 
Um, given that, um, and I apologize again to, to you, Rachel, and to you, Dan, for the late uh, comments that I sent to you, and I, I, can, I can only plead that I've been overloaded over the past uh, couple of months. But the, I, I, would, I would like to uh, propose an amendment to the resolution because we have three policies here. I see no issue with purchasing or procurement, but I do have uh, concern about uh, policy 5600 as written last time, but not in tonight's packet. The reason for my concern is that um, the, the policy, the revised policy, um, contemplates qualifications of issues such as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to publish. And when I was able to go through it in detail on the second read, I have some concerns about, um, about the overall uh, proposed revisions, but specifically to the qualifications in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think this is a port, an important enough topic since it drives the code of conduct and how the code of conduct mm -hmm. will be implemented and interpreted. Um, I, I believe that it requires a little bit more discussion among the board in a study session and perhaps again in a public meeting. So um, I would like to amend taking that out for this particular vote uh, in order to do a little more work around that policy because I think there are some substantive issues to, to discuss that would be very, um, I think, very important to the community to understand in depth. Uh, is there a... I would second the amendment. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm for or, or against the changes, but it's way too important to do on the fly, Absolutely. right? So we should pull 5,600 out, ta uh, which then affect is tabling, tabling. Right? Right. But, but not really, right? It just, not really. We're taking it out, right? We'll discuss it, and we'll come back. And, then and we'll I also didn't know, Steve, whether anyone else had responded mm -hmm. in that time. I got kind of in a panic when I made the second read, and I was like, wait a second. No, yeah, no it, that's it, appropriate. It deserves, yep. it deserves you know, thoughtfulness. So, so we have a so motion, and we have a second for that motion. All those in uh, favor of the proposed amendment by removing uh, policy 5600, uh, state by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right, hearing none, we have amended the resolution 81 to exclude the second reading. So can I have a resolution for 81 uh, that is uh, now only including purchasing and also procurement? So moved. It's been moved Second. and seconded. Um, all those in favor state by saying aye of uh, resolution 81. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. All right, the final resolution is the membership in the Michigan High School Athletic Association. This is an annual one that we have to do every year in our participation. Uh, Dan, any other comments you'd like to share regarding Resolution 82? No, I mean, this, you're correct. This is an annual resolution for membership. All right, um, board, is there a motion for Resolution 82? So moved. Second. So moved and second. Um, all those in favor of motion 82, please state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So no, I say. So I'd like to make a motion for a resolution number 83. The resolution is to name John Silvari as interim superintendent, effective July 1st, 2018. Can I get a second for uh, adding uh, Resolution 83, which would name John Silveri as the uh, interim superintendent effective July 1st? Does it matter that there's no notice of this and it's not in writing? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't have to be noticed. It doesn't have to be noticed. Uh, motions can come from the table. It should be in writing. So, you know, we, we would have to add Fran needs to make sure she's got the words that mm -hmm. Kim just read and then it would be posted in the... Yeah. In the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, it's been uh, motioned. So now someone has to second. So we would need a second for that. Second. It's been seconded by Trustee Ejeluni. Fran, do you want to read it back? Make sure you've got it correctly. Give, let's give Fran a chance to make sure she's got it. So resolved, John Silveri appointed interim Terms superintendent. Effective July 1st, 2018. All those in favor of motion 83, uh, please state so, by, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. All right, moving down to information and discussion. Dan? Nothing additional. Calendar, uh, we've yeah, already yeah, yeah, discussed yeah. the calendar. Uh, I will uh, state this meeting adjourned at 1049. Thank you, board. Thank you all very much. Whew.